delegates. Uh, we obviously have really good participation today, and, and that's, uh, that's very good to see. Uh, I likewise would like to welcome you all to the second day of the IMO seminar on the development of a regulatory framework for mass. Uh, yesterday, as Jillian mentioned, was a very interesting day. Uh, the three panels giving the status report on mass technology uh, and uh, some really uh, fascinating developments, including the, the 10,000 kilometer voyage by the prison courage without uh, human intervention and the, the two 400 kilometer voyages in Tokyo Bay. Uh, these projects highlight that that the technology for mass is at an advanced stage. And as highlighted by the industry reps yesterday, the absence of clear regulation is, is one of the primary barriers to further sector growth. And I think it really is um, important to note that the legal framework and the technological advances are really completely intertwined here. Um, and we can't uh, simply look at the technology, which may be the fun part, uh, without looking at the legal implications. And I think today is what uh, you'll be focusing on. Uh, but even yesterday, when the, the focus was on technology, it's clear uh, that the legal questions uh, have to be resolved. And uh, I think today will we'll help bring some clarity to some of those legal issues. Uh, we'll be looking at uh, legal questions that have been raised ever since uh, mass started being discussed in the IMO, uh, and in particular, whether an autonomous, a fully autonomous ship can operate within the existing law of the sea framework. We have some distinguished representatives from the academic world who will be giving us their legal analysis of how and where mass fits within UNCLOS, and we'll also be looking at specific legal and regulatory obstacles to be overcome to ensure an appropriate fit into the international regulatory framework, uh, such as things like communication, enforcement, liability. Uh, and finally, we'll hear about national implementation efforts to allow for mass operations. I wish you all a very successful day, uh, just as was uh, yesterday, and please uh, enjoy the conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fred. Uh, so just some housekeeping from me before we get on with the presentations. So for presenters, you may share your slides when you're given control. And I'd ask you, since we have a lot to get through today, to please stick to the time limits, um, which will be good for delegates and ensure that everyone gets to present and that we have time for Q&A at the end of each session. And as you'll have seen from the schedule, we do plan to use a format of presentations and then Q&A. For those of you who are participating in the session, I'd ask you as usual to please mute your microphones and switch off your cameras unless you are asking a question. And that is a good segue into the questions. I, I propose to do it a little bit differently from yesterday's session. So if you would like to ask a question once all of the panelists in a panel have finished with their presentation, if you could use the chat function in Zoom uh, to put your name and your delegation name and ask for the floor. And uh, I will give you the floor during the Q&A session. As uh, Henrik Etchenfors, who moderated yesterday, advised, the presentations will be made available after the seminar, subject to the uh, consent of the person making the presentation. And finally, we will be advising the Joint Working Group on Mass, which will start, uh, let me see, it will start tomorrow morning. Uh, we will advise them of the outcome of this seminar. So as Fred briefly mentioned in his presentation, the second day of our seminar is organized into three panels, which all focus on regulatory issues. And as I said, each panel will be followed by a Q&A session. We hope to be finished at 2.30 today, London time. And the way that we've structured the panels is to start with one on uh, the international law framework of UNCLOS. And we have some distinguished panelists who will present on that. Then there will be a, a panel dealing with more specific legal issues associated with, with mass. And then our third and final panel will look at some domestic implementation issues. So I'm very excited about all of these panels. And without further ado, I'd like to move on to the first one, 
which we've entitled Regulating Mass Within the Framework of UNCLAWS. We have three speakers. Uh, the first is Professor Aldo Chirkop, who is Professor of Law um, at the Marine and Environmental Law Institute of the Schulich School of Law at Dalhousie University in Canada. And he will present on Mass and Law of the Sea. And Aldo, I'd invite you to take the floor. Thank you very much, Julian. Good morning, uh, everybody. I'm going to uh, share my screen. And um, as uh, Julian mentioned, I'll be speaking to issues in the law of the sea that might be relevant for mass and more specifically for remotely operated and autonomous uh, ships. And let me first of all start uh, with a bit of a historical note on the law of the sea. And that basically is that technology has always been a principal driver of the law of the sea. The law of the sea has developed in response to technological as well as, of course, uh, commercial and other developments. So if we go really back in time and think in terms of the cannon shot rule, which uh, um, was at the origins of uh, the notion of the territorial sea that we uh, have, basically, um, we see there that uh, the, the extent of coastal state jurisdiction developed because of the ability to exercise certain control from land uh, through a piece of military technology. But um, if we keep on looking at other developments in the law of the sea into modern times, we see basically that, um, again, the law of the sea has responded to particular technologies, such as, for instance, the movement of submarines for the regime of uh, transit passage. Uh, I think in terms of uh, drilling on the, cont uh, on the continental shelf, indeed, the regime of the continental shelf itself, and the regime of scientific research, again, is purely based on technologies that have enabled um, uh, developing a better understanding of oceans generally. So the law of the sea has been responsive to technologies, and this is what we can expect with uh, mass. And indeed, uh, generally accepted rules and standards, international rules and standards, what we briefly uh, refer to as gyras uh, for shipping. Uh, these have, de have been developed by the IMO in response to particular technologies. So um, whether you're talking about uh, the hulls of ships, the various classes of ships, what ships um, perform by their functions and so on, particular classes and so on, again, these reflect technological uh, developments. So then the question for us is, what does mass mean then for the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which is the instrument which uh, provides a constitutional framework um, to govern the activities of uh, ocean space. Um, this instrument, of course, we have to remember, is not the only instrument or the only body of law in the law of the sea. Um, much of what is in the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea is also reflected in customary international law. For the purpose of this presentation, though, I'm going to be focusing on the convention or LOSC for short. And perhaps a, something to mention right up front. When the law of the sea uh, was, uh, when the law of the sea convention was negotiated over a 10 year period between 1973 and uh, the end of 1981, it was really intended that all issues relating to the law of the sea um, will be addressed by the, by the convention. And then this is indeed the text in the preamble of the instrument. So clearly the, um, the negotiators of the convention wanted to develop a regime that was inclusive of all ocean activities. So the intention was to address all ocean uses. And that is something I would say is quite important for us to understand by way of context of the convention, as well as its purpose in interpreting its uh, provisions. So the Law of the Sea Convention was clearly intended to address international navigation and shipping, all aspects of international navigation shipping, I would say. So then the question for us is, what might be the law of the sea consequences of mass? 
given the emerging characteristics of this technology. And of course, the fundamental assumption made in the law of the sea that ships are crude. So before I move forward on this, I uh, would uh, perhaps refer to the degrees of autonomy as understood uh, at the IMO. So clearly, the first two degrees don't really pose uh, issues for the law of the sea because we really have crews on board. That there is a certain degree of automation on board ships basically is not something exceptional for the law of the sea. Indeed, um, uh, automated operations in engine rooms and so on have not really raised any questions. Uh, rather, this is a matter for IMO regulation. IMO is the competent international organization for the regulation of shipping, for setting standards. So therefore, the technicalities, as it were, of what is expected of these technologies and how operations on board the ship are to take place are really the realm of the IMO. The Law of the Sea Convention simply provides a framework for it, but the details are really nourished by the IMO. So more of an issue really uh, comes up uh, with uh, the third and fourth uh, um, degrees of autonomy. Clearly, when we have a remotely controlled ship with no seafarers on board. So essentially, once we take the human element of the ship, then the question is, of course, what does this mean, given that there's this assumption of ships being crew, being manned at sea in the law of the sea? And uh, then, of course, um, uh, moving from remoteness to, to full autonomy. So this is, uh, again, a potential game changer for the navigation of ships. And it, it does raise an interesting question in the law of the sea. Uh, how should the law of the sea apply to ships that essentially are navigated on the basis of, uh, of autonomy ships with learning systems uh, on board? So let's look at the law of the sea considerations. Perhaps uh, one of the first things that ought to be mentioned right up front is the definition of ship. This is really not an issue in the law of the sea. Usually we lawyers will concern with definitions because definitions tend to have a jurisdictional element uh, to them. As long as we can characterize a particular technology as a ship, then it will be captured by uh, the rules uh, of the law of the sea convention. Uh, the convention though does not define ship or vessel. And indeed, this is really something left to the IMO uh, instruments. I would argue that the absence of a definition of mass in the law of the sea commission is really not an issue at all, although some people in the literature have raised the question about it. I, I would not think this is really an issue. And instead, um, what we're going to be relying on is the definitions in generally accepted international rules and standards, again, the GIRAS, that would be adopted by IMO um, under uh, within the framework of the Law of the Sea Convention. So basically the Law of the Sea Convention has numerous provisions which make it clear that there is a role for the IMO to play as the competent international organization. And usually uh, states uh, are guided in the Law of the Sea Convention by generally accepted uh, international rules and standards. And sometimes there's reference also to procedures and practices. And usually this is meant uh, uh, to refer to those uh, practices, rules, and so on that are adopted by the IMO. So clearly IMO has developed a regulatory framework that gives content, substantive content to the regulation of shipping within the framework of the convention. So the jurisdictional questions that could arise here are more uh, related to flex state, coastal and port state jurisdiction. The flex state has certain fundamental responsibilities. The flex state is always fundamentally responsible for its ships, and that raises some interesting questions as we shall see. But for our purposes, it might be worth to think in terms also of uh, the coastal state's uh, jurisdiction and its ability to undertake a certain degree of regulation of international shipping uh, uh, with respect uh, to uh, the territorial sea, the waters, in other words, adjacent to its coast. And then there is the port state. Uh, the port state, of course, enjoys sovereignty over its internal waters, but uh, the port state also tends to operate within uh, uh, international rules and standards. Uh, 
So let's look at the flex state first. And uh, recall here that uh, basically every state party to the convention has the right to register any class of ship. So basically what this tells us that- uh, no, John, just, no, John, yeah. What this tells us basically Bye -bye. is that mass as a class of ships um, uh, can be can be registered by any any flex state, and indeed that all ships, all registered ships, enjoy navigation rights irrespective of their class. So what this tells us basically that mass will enjoy international navigation rights just like any other uh, crewed uh, vessel. Now um, the other couple two things that we need to keep in mind here is that the flex state enjoys a kind of a mixture of exclusive primary and concurrent uh, jurisdiction over its ships. Uh, the flex state always has primary jurisdiction over its ships, but depending on the location of the ship. So if, it, if its ships uh, uh, are, for instance, within the internal waters or the territorial sea of, uh, of another state, then the jurisdiction is going to be uh, concurrent. Um, the other thing we need to keep in mind here in the discussion on Mars, especially with respect to remotely operated ships and autonomous ships, is that the flex state has a due diligence duty to exercise effective jurisdiction and control for administrative, technical, and social uh, matters. So this has been explained further now in international case law, and it is very clear that the flex state is expected to regulate and uh, really exercise uh, uh, diligence in, uh, in, uh, um, in exercising jurisdiction over its ships. Now, now, this is an important point to underscore here because the question might arise with respect to uh, vessels that are remotely operated uh, where the persons operated the ship might not be located in the flex state. And then therefore there's a question that in terms of the jurisdiction to be exercised by the flex state. So again, going back to the flex state due diligence responsibilities in a little more detail. So uh, uh, the flex state has a legal obligation to assume jurisdiction of the ship. It cannot walk away from the ship. It has to assume jurisdiction over ships and to take measures as are necessary to ensure safety at sea. So what these measures are, um, will have to be defined uh, in a sense with respect to mass by, by the IMO. So what sort of measures would be considered necessary measures to ensure safety of life at sea with respect uh, uh, to these ships? So again, I'm going to be underscoring here the important role of the IMO in developing gyras for mass. Uh, the flex state is responsible for ensuring that ships are in the charge of properly qualified master and officers. And, um, and uh, in the charge of here, we'll raise, of course, an interesting question, um, uh, because the convention uh, um, suggests here that essentially you have to have people on board the ship, uh, um, people who are in control of the ship. But uh, there might be a way, perhaps, how we can interpret in the charge of um, to, to essentially the charge of persons who may not necessarily be on board a ship, as long as they have effective uh, control of, uh, of the ship. And of course, what we have to be clear here is that these are qualified persons. So again, this raises an interesting question for the IMO to consider what would be appropriate international rules and standard for the qualification of master officers that might not be on board a ship, and uh, but who will be remotely operating uh, the ship. The convention requires that ships are crewed in accordance with their class. So this is interesting. Again, this underscores the assumption that there are people on board. But again, uh, uh, in accordance with their class suggests that mass as a particular class of ship uh, potentially might be defined as, as crewed. So they might not need to be crewed according to their class. So again, um, this goes back to the uh, rules and standards that the IMO will develop. So the convention also uh, requires the flex state to ensure that the master and crew are conversant uh, and, uh, with, the, with the rules and required to apply uh, the various rules concerning safety, collision avoidance, pollution prevention, radio communications, and so on. And again, um, um, this goes back to what are the expectations of those that are in control of the ship 
um, so if they are remotely uh, in control, then that they are uh, conversant uh, with those with those rules. Um, an interesting question, of course, here is with respect to autonomous ships, because then the algorithm potentially is replacing uh, persons on board, persons that are making uh, uh, those decisions, or persons who are in a shore office making those decisions remotely. So uh, this is where we will have to see uh, that international standards uh, will need to be developed specifically for these algorithms to provide equivalence of uh, the kind of knowledge and control that is exercised over a ship. There is an expectation that uh, the flex state will ensure conformity with generally accepted international regulations. So flex state basically will have to ensure that uh, its ships, its mass vessels will be complying with IMO uh, rules and standards. Um, a, a tricky issue that arises in the law of the sea is the duty to offer assistance at sea because the flex state is supposed to require the master on board its ships uh, basically to offer assistance to vessels and persons in distress at sea. Uh, and if you have the scenario of a ship that has no crew on board, the question that arises here is how can this duty be discharged? And one will have to see here what the technologies are capable of. For instance, it may be that a vessel, a mass vessel with nobody on board, um, could be perhaps used as a platform of some sort or could be on standby. Uh, it's not the first time in salvage, for instance, that we have vessels that are actually offering uh, uh, salvage assistance. And we might have other vessels that are on standby, just in case uh, they are needed. So um, there might be different uh, possibilities there. And then... Um, sorry, Professor Trickhopper, I'm very sorry to interrupt, um, but we are at the two-minute mark of your presentation. Okay. So if you could wrap up within the next two minutes, I'd appreciate very it. Very good, Julie. Okay, so, and then the fundamental duty is to ensure compliance with international rules and standards. And again, uh, I identified now specifically the boxes that come from what uh, I've discussed earlier, where perhaps we might need to focus when we're looking at the international rules and standards that are needed here in terms of how these are going to be addressed by IMO guidance. If we can address these through IMO gyras, then uh, we will not really have major concerns, I would say, with respect to the, um, these vessels uh, uh, being able to operate within the framework of the law of the sea. I think it's the last box which raises perhaps the, the biggest issues. And that is perhaps some might say, not really an IMO issue itself, but rather it, the, the responsibility of the flex state. The flex state will have to see how it's going to be in a position to exercise effective jurisdiction and control in those instances where essentially the vessel is uh, crewed from or, or is operated from another uh, jurisdiction. So in other words, the crew are not immediately on board uh, the ship. So that uh, can be an interesting question to debate. But let me move uh, just quickly here. Uh, so the coastal state, there will be some questions here. Um, with respect to the jurisdiction that the coastal state can exercise over mass, but of course, this will be jurisdiction that has to be exercised in accordance with the IMO gyras developed specifically for these classes of ships. Questions could arise with respect to the port state here in terms of how the inspection is going to be undertaken, but this is equally true of the memorandum of understanding on port state control. And the, what will have to be uh, clarified here essentially is that dialogue, who is the inspector going to be in contact with? There's got to be a person, obviously, or persons that will be able to answer the questions of the port state inspector and essentially to be able to receive the, res the report and address any deficiencies that might be identified. But again, this might be simply a technical operational method. So in conclusion, I think the Law of the Sea Convention should be regarded as a living instrument. Its context and purpose are really responsive to new technologies. And I would say that MAS is, again, perhaps a challenge, yes, but it's not one that cannot be addressed by the Law of the Sea Convention, in my view. Um, so there is an importance uh, that ought to be attached to the context of the Convention, but also the need for pragmatic and functional interpretation of laws. This was the intention of the negotiators of the convention, to make the convention work for all uses of the seas. 
So the IMO clearly is the competent international organization to develop uh, the generally accepted international rules and standards for mass under LOSC. And that uh, basically uh, the LOSC rules, including jurisdictional rules, will be nourished by the gyras to be developed by the IMO and MAS are really no exception. They will be like other ships. And gyras already play an important role in the interpretation of LOSC. So the IMO has perhaps implicitly interpreted aspects of the convention simply by developing international rules and standards and will clearly continue to do so with MAS. And uh, my concluding point is that mass issues can likely be addressed through Gaia Sander Lusk. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chirkov. It's an interesting presentation and a lot of uh, useful information. Our second presenter is uh, Yuri Van Logchem, and he is a senior lecturer at the Institute of International Shipping and Trade Law at Swansea University. And um, I'll invite you now to take the floor, uh, Yuri. Um, thank you, um, Gillian. Good morning, um, everyone. Um, I will try to share my screen. Um, yes, I think it should be um visible um so i want to more specifically look at the question of if you consider mass in relation to the law of the convention would it constitute a paradigm shift or is it more similar to um old wine in new wineskins in the sense that mass can be accommodated um under the law of the sea convention um, i will deal with, with this very briefly Currently, I think Mars are still more in the experimental phase. Most of the um, voyages, they have been either authorized by a particular state. Um, in general, I think that um, the international law of the sea framework, which encompasses not exclusively um, the law of the sea convention, but also the IMO conventions, um, that at present, they, they still have a more limited relevance but of course the perception is that there is, are going to be international voyages mass are going to um, go through the territorial seas of coastal states and i think at, at that point but probably also already um, before that that is when the law of the sea convention and the international law of the sea framework will become particularly um, relevant um, more general i think it is um, to be applauded that the imo is already taking up the gauntlet to look at the issue of mass. There certainly are difficulties. Um, how significant those are, I think there are different uh, views um, in that regard. But I think nonetheless, um, there is the option to consider the issue before rather than after the um, fact. So if you look to um, the future and when mass would be taking on international voyages, then the Law of the Sea Convention or Law of the Sea generally does pose certain questions, including are they ships in the sense of the Law of the Sea Convention? What about, and I think this is a very important aspect about how can the flag state ensure that MAS do indeed, um, or to put it differently, how can the flag state make sure that it, it does um, make sure that the obligations that are laid on the flag state are indeed um, complied with. Um, Professor Chirkov already pointed to that the two most problematic categories of mass would be those um, that in fact don't have a human presence. I think in relation to those two, so when you have mass with an onshore remote controller um, and when mass are completely operated by a uh, algorithm, I think those two um, would be the most problematic. Well, very generally speaking, what the Law of the Sea Convention does, it divides the seas and oceans into different maritime zones, and subsequently it attributes different rights and obligations to states. So states are not exclusively the flag state, but port states, coastal states, um, etc. Generally speaking, the Law of the Sea Convention does represent the most elaborate collection of conventional rules dealing with the seas and oceans. And to a large extent, it is a comprehensive um, 
instrument. And also meant to be comprehensive, as Professor Jacob also mentioned, this is also indicated in the preamble, for example. If we go back in time, and if we look at the history um, of the negotiations, um, negotiation or the Law to Sea Convention was, or was negotiated over um, almost a decade, which is a very long period of time. It ended into force in 1994 and has been a highly successful um, convention. I think there's little discussion on that if you take the Law to, Sea Law to Sea framework broadly, so if you include the IMO conventions, there is a need for, for, for change. I don't think that is much of an issue. But a more significant bone of contention would be is how significant do these changes um, have to be? For example, um, can we confine this exercise to amending the IMO convention or is something more significant required um, beyond that? And the main difficulty would be that if you look at the Law of the Convention, if you read its provisions, there is reference, there is, there is at least the assumption um, that ships are indeed um, crewed. Well, briefly on the definition of a ship, it is an important question in the light of that only ships enjoy navigational rights and freedoms in the different maritime zones, but also on the high seas. Um, I think generally there is little discussion on this point. I think the more general assumption is that masks do indeed satisfy the um, ship definition. That mainly has to do with, if you look at their function, if you look at other uh, more specialized conventions, if you look at those definitions, the main attributes of a mass, they are comparable to um, crewed um, ships. There is this difficulty or potential difficulty of that the Law of the Sea Convention doesn't define a ship. Um, in light of there being no definition, there is the question of what implications follow, follow from the fact that there is no um, definition. Well, one argument has been because there is no definition, there's a lot of leeway in terms of bringing um, particular um, entities under the definition um, of a ship. And I think on the whole, if you look at the text of the Law of the Sea Convention, it does not rule out mass um, explicitly. But because of this lack of definition, the definition of a ship largely comes to lie with the individual um, flag state. And I think if you look at Article 91, uh, there is this quite significant freedom for flag states to give a ship um, the status of a ship by attributing um, its nationality. If you look at the national picture, I think there's no coherency. Um, I just looked at the legislation of Malta, which does require uh, an onboard presence. And I think there's still, there's still quite a bit of variation um, in that regard as well. I think one of the main difficulties lies with how flag states would be able to meet all their obligations that are laid out under the Law of the Sea Convention in relation to MAS. Now, Professor Chirkov already gave the full list of um, obligations that may at least raise some issues or questions. Um, I just want to highlight two of them, um, Article 98, which lays out the obligation for any vessel to render assistance. To put it in its proper context, it is a qualified obligation, so it's not an absolute obligation, um, in the sense that there's only such obligation if there's no danger to the vessel, um, for example. But I think I think there's also raised by some states already indicated that if a MAS doesn't have the capacity to render assistance, that that, that would be a reason to not register a MAS um, within um, its registry. Well, this is one obligation that raises questions, but I think more, or more fundamental difficulties would arise in relation to Article 94. So if you look, for example, at Article 94, paragraph four under B, um, there is this requirement that each ship is in the charge of a master, a crew, um, et cetera. And once again, this is a flag state obligation. So the flag state has to make sure that that actually um, happens. 
I think if you really read the language closely, it does not exclusively mention a master, but it also indicates that there has to be a crew and officers as well. So it's not exclusively um, about the master. And then one of the um, more significant questions that does arise is can the master, if you, for example, talk about a remotely controlled mass, can then the onshore operator be, con be considered the mass for law of the sea um, purposes? Well, my more general argument would be that there is more required on the part of the flag state when it does consider registering um, mass. And in part, this goes back to this requirement of um, generally, very broadly, um, every ship does have the freedom to give a ship its nationality, but the Law of Sea Convention does require in Article 91 that there has to be a general link between flag states and um, the ship in question. But there is there are all these flag state obligations. And with regard to mass, I think there are quite significant questions about how will the flag state be able to effectively exercise control over a mass? For example, um, if the mass is operated from the territory of a state different than the flag state. I think overall, most scholars seem to argue that the master can indeed be located um, on shore. I think there are some issues that do need to be considered. For example, Law of the Sea Convention does speak of a singular master. Uh, you do have the issue of how to replicate that particular situation um, on shore. You can think about labor standards. I'm not sure how you can um, do that um, convincingly. But also here, if you look at um, the importance of the master being on board the vessel, there are also local differences here as well. So flag state um, laws do differ in that regard as well. So if you do assume that the master can be on shore, um, I think it has, as already mentioned, more would be required on the part of the flag state. And that is all in order to meet um, this obligation that it exercises effective control um, over um, mass. Because quite clearly, the flag state cannot reduce the extent of these obligations solely based on the fact that mass operate without any crew um, on board. Therefore, I think the flag state, prior to allowing mass to register, it will need to deal with certain legal um, issues. Um, so it will need to at least um, engage in dialogue. It will need to set up certain regulations in relation to, for example, um, if the remote control center would be based in a different um, territory. So the more general question is, can we bring mass on the law of the sea um, convention? And quite often you come across concerns such as, okay, when the law of the sea Con convention has been negotiated, there was no realistic view of that mass were ever going to be um, introduced. Would that be a reason against bringing mass on the law of the sea convention? Uh, I think the short answer would be, and I think, um, Professor Cherikov emphasized this point as well. If you look at the Law of the Sea Convention, it was meant to be comprehensive. It was meant to be a living instrument. Instrument was certainly not meant to be set in stone. So it does have a um, degree of adaptability. That is quite um, clear. The second potential hurdle would be, okay, there is this assumption that the ship is indeed um, mapped. I think if you wade into the territory of treaty interpretation. And treaty interpretation is quite a tricky um, territory. Um, there is the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, which essentially is about how to interpret or treaty on how to interpret the treaty. Um, it does place emphasis on the text, but there's also this reference to um, context. And the context would be the one I just mentioned about um, I'm, I'm very sorry to interrupt, Professor Van Langham. We're at the two-minute mark for your presentation. So thank you. I will try to 
I should be able to do that within two minutes. Um, so Article 31 of the Vienna Convention does also mention that you need to consider the context. And in the international jurisprudence, there's also some judicial support for interpreting a treaty position or treaty provision a functional or in a more evolutionary um, way. Now, that was not the end. Um, let's see. So I think here it is important, and, and I don't want to dwell on this too much, that the Law of the Sea Convention was meant to be a framework convention. So it also recognized that it had to be more specific um, law. And I think here, with regard to mass, there is a need for more specific law as well. So the Law of the Sea Convention is quite flexible, and it is important that the Law of the Sea Convention in general carves out a very significant role for the IMO in relation to setting international standards for shipping, which if you assume masts are ships, then the IMO has that same um, authority to make similar international um, standards. Lastly, there are alternatives. I mean, there have been some suggestions, which I think are quite outlandish, to be honest, about amending the Law of the Sea Convention. I think you can answer this question very briefly. Is that realistic? I think the clear answer would be no. The Law of the Sea Convention is not going to be amended on this particular um, point. That is just far too complicated. And there are alternative options as well. There would be the option of negotiating an annex. I think that is also not very realistic as well. There are only two annexes that have been um, negotiated since the um, Law of the Sea Convention was negotiated. There is the option of negotiating a specific regime or specific treaty um, for mass. I think also here there will be not much appetite among states to really develop a treaty um, which is explicitly geared to mass. Therefore, I think also from a pragmatic point of view, the IMO route is, is by far um, preferable. These can be more, the IMO conventions can be more easily um, updated or changed. There's also the option of creating a um, new regime. So to just give some um, concluding thoughts, although I think there is, at least in certain respects, mass are paradigm shift. This paradigm shift can, can at least to a degree be accommodated under the um, Law of the Sea um, Convention. I think, and this is the point I was trying to make, that particularly flag states, they will really need to seriously think about, are they able to execute their obligations in relation to mass? And that that particular aspect is, is something the flag state does need to consider. Because if it does have the feeling it can't execute its flag state duties, it should in fact not register um, mass. I think in light of the time, I do apologize. Um, um, I think I will stop um, here. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a fascinating presentation. And I certainly agree with your conclusion that the IMO route is uh, the most pragmatic and practical route forward when it comes to uh, mass regulation. Our third speaker is uh, Dr. Murat Summer, uh, who is a Nippon Foundation lecturer at the International Maritime Law Institute. And he will present on the relevance of the law of treaties for integrating mass into the international regulatory framework. So over to you, uh, Mr. Summer. Thank you, Julia. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. It's indeed a great pleasure and honor to address this distinguished audience. Please, first of all, allow me to make the usual caveat that my presentation uh, today only consists of my personal opinion based on my recent research. It seems that autonomy in maritime domain, as in the other modes of transport, such as aviation and land, is rapidly materializing from theory into reality. However, to prevent possible legal tension, relevant existing treaty instruments may need to be amended or interpreted, as well as new dedicated regulations may need to be adopted to realize the integration of autonomous ships. Simply, 
That's why not only the maritime law, but also the law of treaties is instrumental in this process. Ladies and gentlemen, as you may appreciate, first of all, it must be seen whether the map can be accommodated under UNCLOS as a first step to be able to navigate beyond territorial seas. But before looking at UNCLOS, I have been asked to briefly look into what's happening in aviation domain as well, just to see whether any comparison is possible. It's acknowledged that high degree of automation has already been realized in aviation domain. For instance, today, modern autopilot systems can perform complicated maneuvers, follow difficult flight plans, and approach, approach air, airports for landing. And also drones are uh, increasingly everywhere. Unlike shipping, which is heavily regulated by the IMO by means of a number of treaty instruments, the main international legal instrument concerning civil aviation as a framework convention for us is the Chicago Convention. And significantly, this convention has already a provision regarding pilotless aircraft. And in this regard, Chicago Convention can be considered as the first international treaty acknowledging unmanned vehicles. Certainly, as you may appreciate, this might have some legal significance. And if you look at the history of aviation, we, we will see that it, the first official meeting on the unmanned aircraft systems was 2006. So it was uh, 12 years before IMO has started. From the early stage of ICAO deliberations, interestingly, aviation safety and uniformity in the legal framework were the main concerns and considerations, which is also similar to the IMO's practice. Like the other modes of transport presupposes the physical presence of the human element, either as a master or driver, civil aviation also presumes the presence of the pilot. According to ICAO, interestingly, only the operation of remotely piloted aircraft may be realized and especially for cargo operations in line with international civil aviation systems in the near future. And similar to MAP, it is also acknowledged for the unmanned systems that they have to be at least as safe as traditional aircraft. Ladies and gentlemen, to prevent defragmentation of global aviation standards and ensure the safety of aviation, ICAO in 2020 developed non-binding model regulations to assist its member states to establish and or update their domestic laws concerning such systems. And these regulations are intended to be evolving as the technology matures. Basically, they offer a template for interested member states just to ensure common terminology is in use and to align the member states to prepare them for the uh, standard practices. There are certainly obvious differences with respect to the regulators and the regulatory frameworks pertaining to ships, aircraft, and land vehicles. Yet, there are similarities as well. For instance, safety is the main concern and the first step for the regulatory action. Likewise, similar to the example of UNCLOS, being recognized as a living instrument. Some commentators argue that conventions regarding aviation and also uh, land transport are also living instruments. Therefore, it is acknowledged that they can be interpreted uh, broadly. Furthermore, it's advised that whoever is in charge of starting or stopping his vehicle can be considered as a driver or pilot. Perhaps this can be a good analogy as well. Moreover, at some point in the future, joint IMO ICO interagency meeting might be useful for the integration of autonomous technologies, especially regarding search and rescue issues. Now let us look at briefly to the unclosed regime and the role of the IMO.
obviously using the technology to enhance ships is not legally problematic. But as soon as the traditional role of the master, especially, changes, then the legal controversy seems to begin. Nevertheless, ladies and gentlemen, since Grotius, we see that maritime law has always successfully evolved according to the needs of shipping. And there is no doubt that the integration of the mass will also follow the suit. Here, I would like to mention the sterling work of the IMO called Implication of the Uncles uh, for the IMO. Remarkably, this document was finalized in consultation with the others. And it indeed provides a comprehensive overview to the role and work and functions of IMO, which relates to the uncles. It's noteworthy that UNCLOS is an umbrella treaty which delegates the regulation of more specific rules to the competent international organization, as Prof. Chirkov mentioned, to the IMO. So when we look at the regulatory framework, we see that the fundamental principles are stipulated therein. However, detailed rules and regulations or standards are left to the competent international organization. Thanks to this flexibility, the shipping standards can be kept up to date without formally amending uncles. Ladies and gentlemen, it's well established that the IMO has fulfilled a crucial role in ensuring the progressive development of uncles by developing GIRAS and also as a machinery for cooperation and a forum for the adoption of some 50 conventions and many other legal instruments. Even though there are several UN bodies which have certain specific responsibilities concerning the ocean, the IMO has a specific role among these agencies. And it's well established that the expression competent international organization when it's used in singular form, it's exclusively applied to the IMO. Most of the UNCLOS provisions are of general kind. Therefore, these provisions can only be implemented through the operative regulations. As such, while setting up the legal framework for the obligations of the flag port and coastal states, as well as for their rights, UNCLOS referred substantially to the international rules and standards developed by IMO, perhaps more than 35 pro, uh, articles. And to prevent the birth of a lacuna concerning the status of MES under the law of the sea, considering the convention, convention's explicit empowerment, and in line with it is clear mandate, IMO this is not a choice actually, it's a task and it has to fulfill its role in eliminating uncertainties to accommodate mass. In addition to that, IMO has the necessary experience as well. For instance, the establishment of legs and the adoption of the intervention convention in the wake of Tory Canyon incident shows that IMO didn't and doesn't shy away from addressing international uh, emerging maritime issues, as long as they are related to international shipping. Therefore, the organization should not hesitate to look into and interpret the relevant parts of UNCLOS, which are related to international shipping. Obviously, this can, this can be done by legal committee. Indeed, in accordance with Article 34 of the IMO Convention, the committee is empowered to consider legal matters within the scope of the IMO. And if a resolution can't be reached, then the next step is the IMO assembly. And perhaps this is very, very last resort, but if for some reason there is no consensus or, or agreement on the integration of MES, perhaps even an advisory opinion from the ICJ can be a last resort. It's also crucial for interpreters to be fully aware of the primary purposes of the treaty. For instance, 
if there is an issue which requires an interpretation concerning a treaty regarding the safety aspects of navigation, then the interpreters naturally should consider the ultimate objective of such treaty. Significantly, ladies and gentlemen, the VCLC does not impose the method or dictate the outcome for treaty interpretation. In order, however, for treaty to remain applicable, over time, obviously, some amount of flexibility is required. But having said that, clearly, any interpretation must be compatible with the convention's ultimate purpose and its context. Now, let us look into the evolutionary treaty interpretation briefly, which may be relevant for the interpretation of generic terms of uncle. As you may appreciate, since various conditions are subject to constant evolution and change, no treaty is meant to last for eternity. Thus, they have to be adapted to evolving situations. Therefore, it's acknowledged that the views of the contracting states regarding the meaning of a certain treaty term or provision may change over time, in particular, especially for new technology. I would like to highlight that evolutionary treaty interpretation is not a, is not a method, but an approach that tries to establish the meaning of a term or provision of a treaty at the time of their interpretation, rather than the time of their adoption. In a nutshell, it argues that the meaning of term used in treaties can change with time, even without any formal amendment. And indeed, this could be instrumental in interpreting the term ship and master as opposed to must and remote uh, master. Ladies and gentlemen. Sorry, Murad, I'm just giving you notification of uh, two minutes for the rest of your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Since uh, Dr. Yuri already mentioned uh, the difficulties of amending Yankulos, I will uh, skip this part. And finally, the operation of MES certainly depends on whether they are legally recognized as vessels. First and foremost, I would like to note that there is no unified definition of ship or vessel in international law. The term vessels and ships are being used interchangeably, irrespective of their operating mode and whether the ship is manned or not. In fact, it's interesting to note that Ankylos III consulted IMO regarding the use of terminology with respect to ship and vessel, not the other way around. And indeed, ladies and gentlemen, the interoperability of UNCLOS regime and IMO since the UNCLOS 3 permits the evolution of regulatory framework to respond to emerging challenges. Moreover, UNCLOS attributed attributes the exclusive competence to states to determine the conditions for granting the flag, their flag to the ships. Article 91 stipulates that all states have to fix the conditions for the granting of their nationality to ships and for the right to navigate its flag without defining what type of vessel should be registered. Therefore, the characterization of a vessel is arguably left to flag states' discretion. Ladies and gentlemen, the convention wasn't designed in the first place to provide all the answers to all issues regarding the use of oceans. In this regard, it's worth noting that UNCLOS does not exclude the progressive development of the law of the sea by referring to it uh, in preamble and it is said. Therefore, the progressive development of the law of the sea or its regime is not merely restricted to formal amendment or to the conclusion of new supplementary instrument. Therefore, it can be achieved through the interpretive implementation as well. To conclude, applying the evolutionary approach for the clarification of the generic term seems to be coherent with the objectives and purposes as well as the preamble of the uncle. However, 
the simple fact that chip is a generic term, for instance, does not certainly provide a carte blanche for the formulating limitless definitions which contain all novel maritime devices as chips under uncles. This would be perhaps subject to whether they are qualified as chips by their flex state and IMOS clarification by means of Kaira as well as ensuing state practice. To conclude, I would argue that it is safe to say that uncles as a framework foundation can accommodate math. Therefore, as long as the international community wishes to accommodate math, the text of the uncle can be interpreted broadly. And moreover, since the navigational rights on the high seas are given to the states rather than to ships, I would argue that other states have to respect the operation of math on the high seas as long as they are registered. Yet, their admission to foreign ports may be a different story. Finally, presuming the maps are considered as ships, the rules of UNCLO regarding the rights and duties would be applicable to such ships without requiring any formal amendment to the UNCLO. Having said that, Gairas of the IMO can certainly guide the international community and clarify any doubts at the early stage, especially at the early stage of such autonomous operations. Thank you all for your attention. And uh, thank you, Marat, for a very interesting presentation. Now I'd like to move to the question and answer period. And uh, what I would suggest is that if you would like to ask a question, please indicate so in uh, the chat. And when I give you the floor, if you could also indicate uh, to whom you would like to address your question, I would appreciate it. Uh, so I noticed that Spain asked for the floor earlier in the presentation. So I will give the floor to Spain first, followed by Argentina and then Belgium. So Spain, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Chair. Uh, it's, a, it's a question for both uh, Professor Chirkop and Professor Van Longshen. Uh, it's related to the case that the law of the Sea Convention establishes that some states duties, uh, and even if an alternative regime is developed through IMO uh, guidance, the law of the Sea Convention duties remain constant. So, oh, please, professors, both. Um, which way a, a mass remote control center can be play, can be placed at other state than the flag state and be within the effective jurisdiction of this flag state? Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, maybe uh, Professor Chirkup, I'll turn to you first and then following that, Professor Lachlan. Thank you, it's an excellent question. And uh, this will be something that the flex state will have to think about. The, the, the IMO is not really concerned with the exercise of jurisdiction per se, but rather uh, with the um, rules and standards that have to be applied in the exercise of jurisdiction make the distinction there. So, so if I were a, let's say, advising a flex, I, I think if I were to put myself in those shoes, I, um, I would need to ensure that um, I will be in a position to exercise jurisdiction over the persons that are remotely operating the ship, wherever they are. And uh, I, I've said elsewhere in, uh, in different uh, contexts that, for instance, uh, my inclination would be to advise the flex state to require that uh, the mass operation be conducted, if it's to be conducted remotely from the flex state itself. And the reason is purely on the basis of territoriality. Jurisdiction is very, very clear. Um, if the flex state uh, rather permits that a ship is operated from another jurisdiction, uh, it will have to uh, contend with the situation where that other state also exercises territorial jurisdiction over the shore office that is remotely operating the vessel flagged under the flag state. So you could have a situation of parallel jurisdictions there. And that could be complicated because let's say if the vessel is on the high seas, um, the, uh, the flex state is supposed to have exclusive jurisdiction over the vessel on the high seas. So you see here the potential legal conundrum 
that could arise for the flex state. So my advice to a flex state, if I were advising a flex state, would be to put oneself in a position where one can actually exercise effective uh, uh, jurisdiction without necessarily competition, having competition from another jurisdiction. Thank you, Mikeela. Thank you very much. Um, would you like to add to that, Yuri? Um, I can be very brief because I, I in, to a large extent, I do agree um, with, with Professor Chirkov about, I think it's indeed crucial for the flag state to make sure that the instruments are in place, that it does indeed is able to um, effectively exercise flag state jurisdiction. And there's an obligation it has. So I think how you're going to do that practically, um, that will be a very difficult issue. So I certainly... Um, I do appreciate the question because I think this is a very tricky um, issue that flag states have to deal with. And if they would be most pragmatic, um, as, uh, as Aldo suggested, they would require the operator to be in their own territory. That would be the most um, easy and, and not so cumbersome um, option. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and now I would like to give the floor to Argentina. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Madam. It's very good to see you uh, chairing this panel. Uh, Madam, uh, first of all, um, on behalf of Argentina, thanks to the three presenters, they were very clear and everybody is aware of the fact that Argentina has been insisting in dealing with UNCLOS in our work with regard to mass. Um, we um, thank in particular the comments made with regard to the importance of Article 94. Just would like to highlight that Article 94 of UNCLOS does not say crew. It says that flag states need to ensure that the ships are manned. manned. Uh, and here we are dealing with unmanned ships, at least categories three and four, that probably present the highest challenge in legal terms. They also um, were clear and we thank them for um, highlighting the need to comply with the obligations of ships and flag states with regard to possible damage to the marine environment, the duty to render assistance, the complementary role of insurance in particular with regard to the marine environment, and everything goes down, at least in my view, to the question of genuine link and whether at least levels three and four of automation can be understood to be included in UNCLOS uh, as a ship enjoying all the um, privileges and rights of navigation. Um, I think that the, the recent an element that might be missing here, which is because it, it is more or less clear, there's a question of treaty interpretation. And thanks for that. Um, it is also clear that the IMO is the organization that sets standards for shipping, standards, but not treaty interpretation. I mean, not interpretation of a treaty <laughs> that is outside the IMO. So the question is probably what is missing here is to identify the competent body to identify UNCLOS, which at least in the view of Argentina is the meeting of state parties to UNCLOS because it is parties to interpret a treaty, not an international organization. Um, and, and we believe that there, there are two aspects that maybe they, they would like to um, refer to. Um, the, the first one is the importance of treaty interpretation by the competent body that, in our view, is the parties to UNCLOS, but eventually it could be the tribunal for the law of the sea. I really don't understand why there is a suggestion that it could be the ICJ. Um, the other one, um, and I'm sorry, I need to disagree with Professor Sumer, uh, UNCLOS is not an umbrella treaty. It is a regulatory treaty but it recognizes some competence to some organizations, among them IMO. But the IMO has a competence for standards for shipping, not for interpreting UNCLOS. So the, the two aspects would be uh, regarding the competent body that in our view is the parties to UNCLOS, 
in the meeting of state parties to UNCLOS, the SPLOS, uh, the possible role of ETLAS. And, and probably if they can elaborate on, much has been said that the flag states should ensure, the flag states should take measures. Um, if there is no agreed uh, interpretation of UNCLOS in the competent body, there could be also some reaction by coastal states uh, that could start to adopt unilateral legislation on this. And in the end, a consensual treaty interpretation on this aspect is essential for avoiding disputes. So if they could share their views on, on this, we would be very grateful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Argentina. Uh, there was quite a lot there, but maybe what I'll do is turn very briefly to each of the panel members to, to respond to Argentina's question. Uh, and maybe uh, I'll start with you, uh, Marat. Thank you, Gillian. Thank you, uh, distinguished delegate of Argentina. Uh, first of all, uh, the CRP does not enlist the competent organization for the interpretation of treaties. But however, when we look at the IMO Convention in its Article 34, it explicitly notes that the legal committee shall consider any legal matter within the scope of the organization. And since UNCLOS points out to the IMO as the competent international organization for the uh, adoption of and regulation of international shipping standards, I think it's only natural uh, to expect that IMO can interpret the certain parts of the UNCLOS provided that they are relevant to the international shipping. Moreover, I have also referred to ICJ uh, for the simple reason regarding the advisory opinion, and that, as I have noted, it's very, very last resort. And if I was uh, advising on this, I, would, I wouldn't uh, recommend this until uh, the very end of the process. Regarding advisory opinion, again, this is uh, noted in the IMO Convention uh, that it explicitly refers to the ICJ for seeking advisory opinion. And moreover, this is also recorded in the UN Charter. And IMO is explicitly written uh, therein so that it can seek uh, advisory opinion. Obviously, advisory opinions are not binding unless, uh, unless provided otherwise, but still they carry uh, great legal weight. And my uh, last comment uh, would be on Article 94. Yes, uh, I agree. It is clearly written that the ship should be in the charge of master and officer. However, uh, as it can be seen on Article 94, 4B, it doesn't uh, indicate the location. So for the, at least for the first three degrees of mass, there will be human element in the loop, whether it is either on board, or remote control center either on shore or any other mother ship. And moreover, more significantly, Article 94.5 refers again to the IMO for the guidance. Therefore, I, I feel like there is enough room to maneuver for IMO for interpretation. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we could probably debate some of these issues for a long time, but I'm conscious of the fact that time is, is ticking. Uh, so what I'd like to do, because Belgium has also asked for the floor, to give the floor to, to Belgium for um, their question, and then we will uh, need to get on with the other panel. So thank you very much for that answer. And Belgium, uh, I give you the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning uh, to everyone. Um, conscious of the time, uh, I will first thank the presenters for their presentation. They were very interesting. My question relates to uh, the roles and duties of a coastal state um, to ensure the safety of navigation in its territorial sea and its EEZ. Um, for example, in zones where there's a lot of traffic, could you say more about so the roles and duties of a coastal state under UNCLOS and also maybe other in other IMO conventions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, so maybe this one, I will turn to Professor Van Lachem first. Um, I think that, that 
to be honest, I think that um, Professor Chirkov can, can better deal with this question than I can, because I think he, he did have a slide on um, the flag state. So I'm happy to uh, defer to um, him. Okay, fair enough. Uh, and uh, that's fine. So Professor Chirkov, please go ahead. Uh, thank you for that question. And you, your question is actually very important and um, it underscores how important it is for the IMO to develop gyras for mass. Why? Because the coastal state clearly has uh, the, the power, the regulatory power uh, to enact laws and regulations uh, governing innocent passage. And, uh, and those uh, um, regulations um, are expected to be consistent with uh, gyros. So um, until we have uh, um, gyros from the IMO specific to Mars, it is conceivable that a coastal state might say that the current international law requires that all ships be crewed, they, mu they must be manned. And that therefore vessels that are not manned might not be entitled to exercise innocent passage. It is conceivable that they might say that, you see. So, so um, uh, and they might say that in particular in those waters which might be congested with traffic. So for greater safety awareness. And, and also because we're looking at these technologies at an, a very early stage, so we, you know, they're not fully tested yet for their safety, a coastal state might be reasonably concerned about having um, uh, unmanned vessels navigating in, in congested waters. So, so my, I, I think at the moment we're in a transitional period. There's a bit potentially of an issue, a gap. And the sooner we have IMO gyras for mass so that Essentially, they will be entitled um, to enjoy all navigation rights, as they are, of course, under the law of the sea, but subject to the safety standards. Um, then uh, until, until we come to that situation, we could have coastal states, I would argue, being concerned. Thank you very much. And um, I'd like to wrap this panel up now, but I'm very grateful as I'm sure all of the participants are to the three panelists for very thoughtful uh, and thought provoking presentations. So we actually do not have a break scheduled between uh, this panel and the next panel, and we are running a little bit behind time. So I would like to immediately start the next panel. I apologize for those of you who know me, you know I drink a lot of water, so this is tough for me too. But um, um, we, our next panel focuses on um, legal issues related to communications and enforcement. So we're looking at specific legal issues that arise uh, in mass operations. We have two speakers. Uh, the first is Professor Robert Beckman, uh, who is an emeritus professor at the Faculty of Law at the National University of Singapore. And he is going to present on the implications of mass on uh, unpause. So over to you, Professor Beckman. Uh, thank you very much, Gillian. Let me try to share my screen. Uh, can you see that okay? Uh, is that visible? It is. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Speaking about on-class mass and IMO instruments, um, part one, I have an overview and uh, sorry, I'm having some, you can, okay. Non-class is a framework convention, as Aldo and others have said, intended to be updated by IMO instruments. It's my view. Uh, provisions in non-class, including those referring to obligations of flag states with respect to vessels flying their flag, can be inter interpreted in light of the IMO instruments dealing with mass. Under both UNCLOS and IMO convention, it's the flag state with primary responsibility to ensure that ships flying its flag comply with the applicable rules and regulations 
on the safety of navigation and ship source pollution. And therefore the flag state must have primary responsibility to ensure that the math comply with the IMO conventions and UNCLOS. IMO can impose obligations on flag states uh, to be in constant communication with the math flying their flag and to ensure that math are continuously under the control of persons who are serving as master or crew. I'll mention a little bit about that later, but Perhaps we should mention that neither master or crew are defined in UNCLOS and therefore IMO would have some scope in defining those terms as well as the term ship and vessel, which is also not defined in UNCLOS. IMO can also impose regulations to assure that the authorities of the flag state are able to communicate with other ships and the coastal authorities with respect to the Met passage of a mass flying their flag. And I think this one is critical, the communications issue, which is the main uh, focus of my presentation. And given the significance of the development of mass on the provisions in UNCLOS, the IMO Legal Committee or the IMO Secretariat perhaps should consult either the UN Division of Ocean Affairs and Law of the Sea or the conference of parties uh, or meetings of state parties regarding interpretation once the IMO has worked out uh, details. Now IMO and UNCLOS, I'd like to bring this up. It's not directly on my presentation, but I think it's background that's important. During the nine years of negotiations on UNCLOS, the secretary of the IMO, formerly the IMCO, actively contributed to the work of the conference in order to ensure that the elaboration of IMO instruments conform to the basic principles guiding the elaboration of UNCLOS. And I'd like to draw your attention to a ledge document of the latest issue that I found is 30 January 2014, entitled The Implications of UNCLOS for the IMO. It was a study by the Secretariat of the IMO analyzing the relationship between UNCLOS and the IMO instruments covers many of the issues that must be addressed on the implications of mass on UNCLOS and envisages other possible roles for the IMO in connection with the implementation of UNCLOS. Now, this is a quote from near the end of the document. In addition to the new or modified functions and responsibilities directly or indirectly imposed on IMO by UNCLOS, it may be necessary to consider what other possible roles, if any, may legitimately be played by IMO in connection with the implementation of the provisions of the convention, dealing with matters within the field of competence of the IMO, particularly the provisions whose interpretation or application may be assisted by work within the IMO. And I think that is extremely relevant to the issue of math. Uh, Reference may be made in this connection to the articles that concern relate to safety at sea and prevention of pollution in the marine environment. And so many of these articles refer to or presuppose the existence of international regulation standards adopted by the IMO and by reference to which states may implement the provisions in UNCLOS. Uh, UNCLOS is a framework convention, I would argue. It's not simply a regulatory for convention. It uh, has numerous provisions requiring states to take account of, conform to, give effect to, or implement relevant provisions, applicable rules and standards, generally accepted international rules and standards, so on. We, I call them rules of reference, impose obligations on states to ensure that ships flying their flag comply with or implement IMO rules. And this is why we don't want flag states each or individual start flag states starting out and passing their own legislation on math. I think the flag states or the IMO should set the rules and then the flag states must comply with the rules that are set out by the IMO. Uh, for example, on this, any ship exercising transit passage through it, straight use more international navigation must comply with the generally accepted international regs procedures and practices for collisions as well as for shift source pollution. There's other rules of reference. Keep in mind in terms of a men mention that was just made of the power of coastal states to regulate mass. I would draw your attention to article 21.2 
which refers to the power of states to regulate ships exercising innocent passage. 21.2, the second bullet point, that the laws and regulations of coastal states on ships exercising innocent passage shall not apply to design, construction, manning, or equipment of foreign ships unless they're giving effect to generally accepted international rules and standards. So the coastal state does not have autonomy here. They're talking about commanding and equipment. They can only give of a, a ship exercising innocent passage. They can only give effect to the generally accepted international rules and standards, which would be those set out by the IMO. Now, what I was asked to talk about is part three, communication of mass with authorities in coastal states and with other ships, because as I reflected on this issue, I think this is perhaps the most critical. Authorities in the coastal state must be able to communicate with a mass that's about to enter their territorial waters or their archipelagic waters uh, or is going into port. So with respect to matters such as compliance with regulations of the coastal state on mandatory ship reporting, on vessel traffic systems, coastal state could require that mass uh, navigate their territorial sea. They must use sea lanes and traffic separation schemes, and therefore the coastal state must be able to communicate with the mass or who is ever in control of the mass or whatever is in control of the mass. Also, with respect to compliance with obligations under UNCLOS. There's an incident of navigation. The flag state and coastal state must uh, cooperate to investigate. Whether coastal state might believe that a particular mass is not, is not complying with the rules on innocent passage, it must be, able to, must be able to communicate with the vessel or with whoever is in control of the vessel. Similarly, compliance with the rules on archipelagic sea lanes or extra, uh, innocent passage when they're going through an archipelagic state. With respect to the, another area of communication between mass and coast guard vessels of the, uh, the mass or the re or master or remote control operator must be able to communicate with coast guard or naval vessels of a coastal state or archipelagic state concerning incidents in the territorial sea or archipelagic waters, say a collision or other incident of navigation, a pollution incident involving a mass, request by a foreign naval vessel to verify the flag of a mass that they suspect, or an attempt by a foreign naval vessel or coast guard to exercise right of arrest of a mass. There may be mass that are involved in criminal activities. You have to be able to communicate with a mass if you are going to arrest it. And again, as I think that's my other speaker in this panel will deal with it, I'm to exercise the hot pursuit against the mass. Again, the assumption is signals and warnings are given. How do you do that with a mass? Uh, communication, if there's an emergency on a mass vessel, the mass must be able to communicate with coastal authorities or other ships if there's an emergency such as a fire aboard a mass, power failure aboard the mass, technical communications problem resulting in it not be able to communicate with a remote control operator or the authorities in the flag state, technical communications problem resulting in a mass not being able to communicate in any way with other vessels that they're approaching, or if there's an unauthorized boarding of a mass, how does the, uh, how, what kind of signal is given and to whom? These are all issues that I hope the IMO would be thinking about. Uh, I'm going to say a bit of word then on part four as well on UNCLOS and the manning of ships and crew. It covers a little bit of what's been covered by Aldo and Yuri, but a bit more. UNCLOS uses the term ship in some parts of the conventional vessel in other parts of the vessel of the convention, and they don't define either. UNCLOS also contains references to master and crew, but there's no definition of either of those terms. And this, in my view, is an advantage because there are no restrictive definitions of the terms that gives UNCLOS the flexibility to be able to interpret the terms in light of technological developments, including mass. Uh, duties of the flag state on manning and crew specifies that such, that 
Such measures must ensure that each in charge, each ship is in charge of a master and officers, an appropriate crew, it's appropriate in qualification and numbers. Uh, another obligation of the flag state to ensure that the master officers and crew are fully conservant, con conversant and required to observe with the applicable regulations on safety at sea, so let's go regs, et cetera. Uh, Again, how does it do that? Article 95 also, in taking the measures called for, this each state is required to conform to the generally accepted international regulations, procedures, and practices. And therefore, it's, again, it's my view, it's the mandate of the IMO to set out those obligations. And the fact that the master and crew are not defined gives flexibility to give a functional definition for those officers uh, when it comes to a remotely controlled or vessel or a completely autonomous vessel. Uh, but in adopting regulations on math at autonomy levels three and four, the IMO should include a provision on the functions and responsibility of the person or persons who would serve as the master. Level three, the master perhaps could be the remote control operator. The level four is a much more complicated issue, but there could be IMO could articulate qualifications and experience a person under the jurisdiction who would be responsible for the voyage, even if the uh, it's in a logarithm that is uh, controlling the ship most of the time, but somebody would have to be available to assume control in case of an emergency. Uh, I don't quite agree with uh, Aldo and Yuri that the remote control operator would have to be based in the jurisdiction of the flag state. The ship itself is under their jurisdiction and control and it moves all over the world. The master and crew are very often of foreign nationalities where therefore there's different jurisdiction. So I would think so long as it's clear that the, the flag state has jurisdiction over the remote control operators, wherever they may be, that may be sufficient, but uh, I think that's an issue that will have to be debated at the IMO. IMO regulations uh, should also set out the requisite qualifications of the master of a mass, including uh, seamanship, navigation, communications, marine engineering. The key issue is whether the person who's designated as the master is able to ensure uh, that the applicable IMO regs concerning safety collisions, uh, pollution, and maintenance of communications can be complied with, uh, and whether the IMO can amend the relevant laws and regulations to take mass into account in order to protect the interests of other ships, but also the interests of port states and, co and coastal states, particularly the coastal states in port states that not they may be uh, not as advanced in terms of technology as others might be. I'm sorry to interject, uh, uh, Professor Beckman. But I you know, just two minutes. Uh, that's it. I I get the Nobel Prize here. Uh, oh well, you definitely get a. <laughs> I'm not uh, sure if it's the Nobel Prize, but you get a prize from me. Okay. Well, we, we in Singapore we ring a bell when your time is up. So if you finish early, you get a Nobel Prize. Uh, Okay, thank, <laughs> thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, and our next presenter is uh, Professor Anna Petrig, uh, who holds the Chair of International Law and Public Law at the University of Basel in Switzerland. And she's going to present on the relevance of a mass code for law enforcement at sea. And I see her on the screen. So without further ado, I will turn uh, the floor over to her. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. Can you see the slides? Yes, we can see them well. Excellent. So I wish to welcome you to my presentation, which turns on the relevance of a potential IMO mass code for maritime law enforcement. So from the vantage point of maritime security, the advent of autonomous ships is really a double edged sword because on the one hand, autonomous ships have a great potential to reduce lawlessness at sea. Autonomous systems augment the capabilities, effectiveness, and reach of law enforcement operations while squeezing their costs. This is why navies, coast guards, and port state authorities already started relying on autonomous ships. At the same time, however, autonomous ships provide criminals with a cutting edge. 
with autonomous ships of autonomy degrees three and four, and that's the type of mass the focus of this presentation lies, perpetrators are no longer on board the offender ship, and this greatly reduces the risks of being killed, injured, arrested, or even detected. detected. And this makes autonomous ships really an attractive tool uh, for committing crimes at sea, for example, to smuggle prohibited items. Autonomous ships are indeed very likely to become a hallmark of drug trafficking in the not too distant future. Spanish and Italian authorities have already detected unmanned crafts built and even used to smuggle drugs. The crafts you see here on the picture are retrofitted uh, boats or um, purpose-built uh, metal containers fitted with GPS technology featuring a do-it-yourself touch. However, with the introduction of rather large cargo mass looming on the horizon, we have seen that yesterday, enforcers must also prepare for the scenario where illicit cargo is transported alongside lawful cargo. This could be narcotics or other prohibited items such as um, illegally traded weapons or goods falling under a sanctions regime. Autonomous ships are thus already today a game changer when it comes to the commission of crimes at sea, and I guess even more so if the technology is used for the operation and construction of mass move through further innovation stages. The use of autonomous ships for the commission of crimes at sea also amounts to a watershed moment for the law. Why? Because, and Aldo Chirkov has already already referred to these assumptions underlying the law of the sea and the rules on law enforcement sea are also firmly based on, on some specific assumptions and these are notably that the perpetrators act from on board the offender ship. The assumption that the human human interaction between suspects and enforcers at sea takes place, which allows for a direct communication between enforcers and suspects and an exchange of physical documentation that proves various facts such as uh, the nationality of the ship or the type of cargo on board. With mass of autonomy degree three and four, that is mass without onboard crew, these assumptions are no longer met. This queries the continued applicability and also relevance of many, if not most, rules designed for the suppression of crime at sea. The envisaged mass code will in all likelihood not directly deal with maritime law enforcement issues. However, the mass code will, even as a matter of priority, deal with a series of transversal issues, such as the meaning, role, and responsibility of the master crew and remote operator, the issue of certificates and questions surrounding remote operation centers. And all these issues are highly relevant for maritime law enforcement. This will be demonstrated at the example of visit and search of a suspected ship on the high seas. During a law enforcement operation or response, communication and interaction between enforcers and suspects is really key. In case offender ships do not carry an onboard crew, the question ensues how law enforcement officials communicate and interact. That was a, an issue also addressed by the previous speaker. Well, the first step of a gradual law enforcement response usually consists in conveying the suspect ship uh, a signal to stop. Historically, ships were hailed by waving flags or using megaphone phones. Today, newer technology such as radio communication is used. To warn a ship, enforcers can fire a shot across the bow, ultima ratio. The legal rules and operational practice in relation to hailing, stopping, or warning a ship are clearly based on the assumption that there is a person on board who is the recipient of the enforcer's signal or who can be impressed by a warning shot. As regards math without onboard crew, this is no longer the case. This implies that other technological means but also other channels to hail, stop, and warn a ship must be considered. However, with mass, it's not simply about using new means or channels, that is, that is how a ship is hailed, warned, or stopped. Rather, mass also involves a new allocation of tasks, and this affects the question with whom enforcers interact. 
Well, in a traditional setting, it's quite plain who the primary interlocutor of enforcement enforcers is. It's the master who is in charge on board the vessel, including for queries stemming from law enforcement officials or authorities. With mass, however, new actors enter the scene and there is a new allocation of tasks. Moreover, various actors will not be at sea, but rather on dry land. This begs a series of questions regarding the interlocutory of law enforcement officials. Who will perform the functions traditionally incumbent on the master if his or her ship is coming under enforcement action, if the vessel is without onboard crew? Will the functions traditionally allocated to one single person, the master, be split and distributed among different types of actors? If so, who is then the interlocutory of law enforcement officials? And could a legal rather than a natural person bear the ultimate responsibility for carrying out specific functions? And again, the question would be, who is then the interlocutory of law enforcement officials? Suppose that there is still a residual crew on board the offender ship. Who is responsible to answer queries of law enforcement officials, those on board or those on shore in a remote operation center or both? Does it matter who is on board? Must they have control over the ship? What if they only carry out tasks which are comparable to those historically carried out by the black gang of a ship? Already at this stage, it becomes clear that determining the meaning, role and responsibilities of the mass, the crew and remote operator is crucial to understand who is in charge of an autonomous ship and with whom law enforcement officials are supposed to communicate. As the envisaged mass code is likely to clarify these questions, it will provide a clear picture as to who is the interlocutory of law enforcement authorities and this is one of the reasons why the mass code is highly important also for maritime law enforcement. Well, after a suspect ship has been successfully stopped, it is boarded in order to carry out a visit and search, that is to verify its nationality and if suspicion remains to search its cargo. As regards visit and search, there are again two assumptions that underline traditional rules. First, that the documents produced to verify a ship's nationality, such as the certificate of reg registry, are physical documents. Second, that the production of these documents take place on board the suspect ship and between human beings, that is, that a physical boarding takes place. With mass, these two assumptions are again no longer fulfilled. As regards certificates, mass will in all likelihood carry e-certificates rather than physical documents. As regards the physical boarding of a mass, there are a series of operational and security concerns. There is no master who could maneuver the suspect ship to accommodate the boarding, to present documents, or to simply answer questions. Moreover, there are security concerns. If you board a ship without onboard crew, how can it be ensured that it does not sail off together with the boarding team? Taken together, this begs the question whether instead of carrying out the visit and search on board the ship, as the legal provision explicitly uh, state, it would be permissible to carry out search and visit in a virtual manner. That means to determine nationality and the cargo of the ship through accessing e-certificates rather than by going on board. In my view, the right of visit could be interpreted broadly in order to cover a virtual visit Provided, however, that the content of all safeguards that must be respected in case of a physical boarding are also respected in case of a virtual boarding. First of all, that access to the respective e-certificates is only granted if there are reasonable grounds to suspect that a mass indeed engages in crime at sea. Further, that in the course of a virtual visit, no other information than the one that could be retrieved through a physical boarding of the ship is obtained. Finally, for a physical boarding, the law provides that only authorized law enforcement officials and vessel engage in visit and search, and that the master and the crew of the suspect ship can verify this. To ensure this, there are various provisions, notably those stipulating that a statecraft engaged in enforcement action must be clearly marked 
officials on board must be uniform and they must provide government issues identification documents for examination by the master upon the boarding of the ship. In the context of MAT, without onboard crew, there is, however, no one to see the markings and uniforms and to check IDs. It has yet to be determined what the functional equivalence could be through which enforcers identify themselves vis-a-vis -vis, uh, systems granting access to e-certificates. In sum, if all these safeguards are respected, a virtual visit is arguably less intrusive than a physical one, notably as in many cases, a virtual visit would not delay a ship's journey. The mass code is likely to address the types of certificates a mass must carry, what format they could take, and how and by whom and under what conditions they must be accessed or produced. Clarity in this respect will help to adapt the law enforcement response vis-a-vis mass. A further transversal issue, and that's the final one I'm going to address, to be dealt with in the AMO mascot are remote operation centers. An issue that is also of high relevance for the suppression of crime at sea. Well, the use of autonomous ships implies a shift from the sea to the land, the ship may only have a reduced or no onboard crew, and key operational functions are carried out on land in a remote operation center. This shift from the sea to the land is also important from a law enforcement perspective. Why? If a suspect is not acting from on board a ship, but from a remote operation center, the patrolling naval state at sea is stripped of two important means it has in a traditional setting, the questioning of suspects, and most importantly, the arrest of the suspect. As a result, an effective law enforcement response in case of mass committing crimes at sea is only possible through a close cooperation with the flag state, who could then carry out the arrest instead of the patrolling naval state. The flag state in turn, only possesses enforcement jurisdiction if the remote operation center and the remote operator are located in its territory, because enforcement jurisdiction under which arrest or questioning person suspects falls is limited to a state's own territory. In other words, if the bridge is taken ashore, the flag state can only jump in and take those enforcement measures which the patrolling naval state cannot take any longer because a funder is simply not at sea, if the operation center and the remote operator are indeed located on its territory and operate from there. So for enforcement jurisdiction specifically, the flag state's competence are limited to its own territory, unless another state would consent to enforcement actions on its own territory. So if by contrast, the flag state is only the place of incorporation of a shell company and the actual operations are not carried out from its territory, the flag state has very little means to enforce the law against persons committing crimes involving ships flying its flag. As a result, neither the patrolling naval state at sea nor the flag state could take measures against suspects. And as a result, a serious enforcement gap would arise. The definition in a future mass code of the link that the remote operation center and remote operators must have with the flag state is thus key for an effective prevention and repression of maritime crime involving mass. If the link is defined in a too loose fashion, the flag of convenience problem will be accentuated in case of mass. I guess the bottom line should be that the remote operation center has its seat and its real operation and personnel in the flag state. To conclude, the planned IMO mass code does not directly address law enforcement at sea. In all likelihood. And yet many, if not all, transversal issues are highly relevant for maritime law enforcement. Regulating these transversal issues will help us understanding many aspects of autonomous cargo ships, how roles and responsibilities are allocated between ships and shore, how mass communicate and how facts in relation to ship and cargo are proven. Essentially, these transversal issues will help us understanding what the object of enforcement measures is 
This in turn allows to better anchor the discussion on how law enforcement responses vis-a-vis -vis mass can and should look like. Well, to come back to the title of my presentation, the IMO mass code is indeed relevant for law enforcement at sea, even if this is not immediately apparent. Thank you very much for your kind attention. And thank you very much, uh, Professor Patrick. That was a fascinating presentation and uh, I think very relevant to us as we embark on our discussions for the mass code as the issues you raised, I think do need to be um, considered when we develop the, the code. So with that, I'd like to open the floor if there are any questions for our last two presenters. And if you would like to take the floor, feel free just to indicate that in the chat. So clearly the presentations were excellent and completely self-explanatory. Uh, so maybe what I will do then is I will take advantage of, of uh, the time and I will suggest that we uh, take a short break until one o'clock and then one o'clock in London, I'm sorry. Uh, so that would be eight minutes, seven minutes from now and we'll see you back uh, then. And I'd like to thank our last two presenters uh, for presenting on some of the practical implications of mass, which at least for me provided lots of food for thought. Thank you everyone and see you now in six minutes.
<clears throat> so welcome back everyone. I hope you enjoyed the, the brief break. I'd like to now open our third panel of the day, which deals with national regulation of uh, the regulatory and technological development of, of mass. We have a number of speakers uh, on this subject who will update, I think, on their national experience, which should be a nice complement to the international framework that we discussed earlier in the day. Our first speaker is Katrina Kent, uh, who works in the Maritime Policy, sorry, Maritime Autonomy Policy Division at the UK Maritime and Coast Guard Agency. And indeed, she is the lead of that division. And she will present on regulating mass navigating a way forward in the UK. So Katrina, I give the floor to you. Thank you ever so much, Gillian. And hopefully, someone yes excellent right we have a screen sharing this is perfect thank you ever so much right so i'd like to spend uh, the next 15 minutes and i will try and keep us to time because we've got a busy session um talking about the uk's regulating mass and navigating a way forward um if i could have the next slide please so um from a UK perspective, um, our approach to maritime has been outlined in Maritime 2050. Um, it was uh, developed in 2018 and published in 2019, um, following a number of um, engagements with industry. And I think, as we all know, um, we won't be surprised by what some of that feedback was, uh, that regulation lacks, lags behind technology. Um, perhaps what did reassure us was that industry wanted regulatory action to be taken and that they needed a regulatory framework and that's something that was echoed yesterday with um, feedback from industry from across the piece not just within the UK. So the aims of Maritime 2050 were to strengthen reputation for maritime innovation, develop a clean maritime growth strategy, uh, grow the maritime workforce and transform their, transform their diversity and then more, most importantly for this session introduce a legislative framework for mass and that's what i will be here to talk to you about today but before we dive into actually that framework what are we doing in the uk right now next slide please so to support industry now because you obviously saw yesterday that we do have vessels operating in uk waters majority of them are under 24 meters they are of the smaller end of the market but they're out there and for us, we needed to give them a route to industry, a route for them to actually be operating. And we use the exemption process. But to support that, we have developed a maritime guidance note that outlines how they can go about that and what to expect for that process. And it's not just for autonomy and autonomous vessels, but also for any form of novel technology, anything that doesn't meet or sit nicely within the criteria and the rules that we already have. It follows um, the alternative design approach that's already established and understood across industry, but this walks um, companies through the process in slightly more detail. At the end of this, what they will receive is a UK load line exemption, it's a UK load line exemption that allows them to operate um, within our waters and um, gives them the ability to go out and actually explore, demonstrate and test that this technology is working. And as we saw yesterday, there's a variety of um, companies using this. But that process is not ideal and it can be long. It's based on a safety case approach as well, I think, which is quite important to highlight. So what we actually need to do is figure out how do we support them in the long term? Next slide, please. As part of doing that, we established with some funding from government um, our Maritime Autonomy Regulation Lab. It was a two year project that I believe some of you will have heard about before because I've spoken about it in different conferences. But the idea was that we explored how could we use industry data, um, government data to support the industry? Um, what was going on in the UK industry? What, what were companies actually up to? And also, what was the regulatory landscape? What were the barriers out there? that was stopping these vessels from operating. And what could we do about that? And I've highlighted on screen um, some of the conclusions that we found from our legal review of the UK's Merchant Shipping Act and areas that didn't necessarily present barriers, but did require clarification. And those in bold, you will see, 
are similar to those that we identified in the IMO scoping exercise. So it's about the role and responsibility of master crew and seafarer, definitions, terminology, um, documents being carried, all these things that have been mentioned this morning in the presentations by um, previous colleagues. Um, but also some specifics related specifically to the UK, for example, questions about enforcement, extent of our jurisdiction and the clarification on the application of local health and safety laws that won't necessarily come up in the IMO discussions, but have been coming up as part of this bigger conversation about how the national regulations fit into this. So what did we do next? Um, can I have the next slide, please? So with that information, there was lots that we took forward, but the piece I'm going to focus on here is the regulatory developments. And we were lucky enough within the UK to be able to start making those changes um, in two areas. The first is our workboat code, which is for vessels under 24 metres. Um, and we were able to start drafting an annex to that document that will support industry in the future. Um, of remotely operated unmanned vessels. The other section, which is looking at our primary legislation and in particular our Merchant Shipping Act, is a future transport regulatory review that we have conducted last autumn. And this specifically looked at maritime autonomy and remote operations and some areas that we could potentially address within our Merchant Shipping Act. Um, they're obviously looking at two different levels. The workboat code is our secondary legislation with more detail and our future of transport element is very much our primary, much broader, higher level aspects. If I could have the next slide, please. So the workboat code, as I mentioned, is for workboats that operate to sea, um, carrying cargo and or passengers, uh, no more than 12 passengers and of less than 24 metres in load line length. As you saw yesterday with the conversation from the UK industry, this reflects primarily what is operating in UK waters at the moment. So it's the area that we have the most expertise. We have that knowledge and that understanding. And we've gone through a number of um, cases where we've issued exemptions and we've surveyed these vessels and we have an understanding of what's needed in these vessels. So the workboat code provides in one document, all the information that's needed to design, construct, the engineering, the electrical systems, the hull, fire protection, etc., for these vessels. It's an alternative. Um, so what we plan to do is have an annex to this document that is drafted and it is ready to go for consultation for remotely operated unmanned vessels. We have focused on that area because that's where we have the expertise. And within this, what we have done is define ROUV as a vessel that no, with no persons on board that is operated from a location remote to the vessel. What we've also done is within this document define what we see as a remote operations centre. We see that to mean either a shore based location which is permanent or mobile or a manned vessel from which an ROUV is operated. As you can see that is very broad. And that reflects the experience we have that not all these vessels, when they're remotely operated, are being operated from a building or an office. They may be operated from the shoreside, from a caravan, for example, from something that's mobile and moving and is put in the suitable location for the operation of that vessel. And it varies depending on the vessels you're dealing with. So that definition gives, gives us the flexibility to show that a remote operation centre can be a wide range of things. The final one that we're including um, amongst many others, but with relevance to this discussion is remote operator. That for us in this context means any person, including the master, with recognised or certificable experience who is engaged in the remote operation of an ROUV. These are high, these are like key for us, key definitions that help us to understand and help industry to have a route to certificate these vessels and actually operate. Um, we're at the point and anyone and I'm sure there are many of us in the room today who are involved in the development of regulations nationally appreciate that timelines are difficult and you're affected by many other factors going on. We are at the point that we're hoping that this will go to public consultation in the coming months 
um, which will then hopefully go for publishing next year. But once it's up for consultation, I would recommend you have a look at it and we will then be able to discuss in more detail some of the very specifics that we've included and the alternatives we've put in there that help a mass get a certificate to be operated. The other area we're looking at, um, next slide please, is our Merchant Shipping Act. And we have been fortunate enough that it was announced in May in our Queen's speech that we will have a transport bill. And within that transport bill, we will include updates in relation to maritime autonomy and remote operations. This, as I've said, is updating our primary legislation. And what we hope it will do will cover all sizes of mass in line with our other regulations. It will give us the powers to regulate remote operation centres. Um, due to a nuance within our regulations, it will also cover autonomous underwater vehicles. We will clarify that software used to operate mass and how that can be regulated and also ensure that our ports and harbour regulations can be updated as well, because they're a key part to this. There's no point in us having a regulation that can give a mass a certificate if it then can't turn up in a port or a harbour and there are limiting factors there. So rather than going through in detail on the wide range of things we're covering, I wanted to focus for the last section of this talk on what I think will be really useful for the IMO conversations. It's actually some of the challenges we faced. And before delving into those, the one I'd like to highlight is that we've decided that we will not be including the degrees of autonomy or defining the degrees of autonomy within our primary legislation. There's a couple of reasons for that. They're not, they're not settled. There's a variety of them out there. We all have some concept of what we're talking about, but different um, companies use slightly different terminology and different degrees. But it's also important for us that it's not necessary from a legal perspective to have them laid down in our legislation. We need to ensure that all of those ranges and all those different combinations can be addressed. Um, through our regulations and we feel that can be done without the need to define them. So if we could move on to the next slide please, I will start by going through some of the um, challenges we've had and challenges that have already been mentioned today so I feel like we're at least all on the same page. So our first dilemma um, is, is mass a ship? And it feels like it's possibly getting a little philosophical and possibly a little navel gazing but it's actually really important and it's an important conversation that we've had and for us in the UK in the Merchant Shipping Act, it defines ship as includes every description of vessel under navigation. Our advice we've received is that yes, a mass is a ship. And therefore that means that actually a lot of our regulations and our ability to regulate can already include mass. We may need to tweak the secondary regulations, we may need to develop areas, but there is the potential to, for those regulations to cover and include autonomous ships and that's really important. The few areas that we are considering is whether innovative design of a ship, a mass, actually means it's still a vessel um, and we're considering using the term craft and we're also considering whether we need to include irrespective of size but at the moment the key outcome there is actually yes a mass from our, from our perspective is a ship. The second dilemma is a, a terminology one We've seen lots of these terms, we've all heard of it, USV, mass, autonomous ship. And we were going along the route of mass, but actually what we've been advised is that automated ship is perhaps a more appropriate term. We were really clear that it has to cover both fully autonomous and remotely operated and all that range in between and the jumping between the different, different options that might happen. And as we saw yesterday, and it's been highlighted already, there is no clear line between a ship and a mass. So the route we are considering is automated ship, a ship capable for some or all of the time of navigating or being navigated otherwise than by a person on board. We did question whether we wanted to focus it on navigation, but actually considered that for a mass to be a mass, the key part is that its navigation is remote um, or is automated. Um, if we could move to the next slide, please. And just a, a quick interjection for me, Katrina, uh, two minutes left. Thank you.
Um, so the key ones here are that we considered introducing the term mass master, um, but as we are avoiding the term mass within the legislation, we've gone for remote master. And that would be in relation to an automated ship, a person except a pilot who has command or charge of the ship without being on board. And then remote operator in relation to an automated ship means a person who is employed or engaged to control by electronic means any way in which the ship operates without being on board the ship. We're questioning whether we need electronic means and whether that limits us, but that gives you the general gist of the routes we're taking. An important point here is that for us, there will have to be a remote master whether that vessel is fully autonomous or remotely operated. The practical role of that remote master for a fully autonomous vessel will be different, but the responsibilities will be the same. And that's quite important for us. And I think it, it covers some of the points that were raised earlier in the ONCLOS discussions. So one that we're challenging, uh, the next challenge we've got is actually, are they a seafarer or not? For us in the UK, we are saying they are not seafarers. Um, MLC applies to seafarers on commercial seagoing ships. These roles will not be on board a ship. Um, there are also difficulties in terms of the financial implications, revalidation of certificates, sea time, and also highlighted earlier the, the implications of local health and safety regulations and how that inter interacts with um, these roles if they were seafarers alongside MLC requirements. So for now, we are saying they're not seafarers, but to do that, we are ensuring that we will have equivalent powers to ensure we have powers to, for, to identify their training, set out their qualifications, but also identify how their manning of these masks can be done through remote masters and remote operators, um, which is a really important point that again has already been mentioned. And then if we can move to the last slide before quick conclusion, the other one we're considering is rocks, home or away. And putting ourselves slightly differently to pieces that have been mentioned before, our perspective is that we will not define this in our legislation, but we will have the ability to regulate the safety of mass and their operation and how that can be done. And we will be allowing rocks to be based overseas. Obviously, as been mentioned earlier, we're not taking the easy route, but we do believe, and this links to our final dilemma about enforcement, that we already have powers and levers in place that we can use to enforce the regulations. And also that this, this approach would follow a similar one to ISM, whereby an audit can take place of a company that's based overseas. And it's part of the prerequisites of wanting to be part on the UK register, for example. Um, there may be alternatives. We may need to consider agreeing a list of places where we accept a rock to be based. But we do feel it's really important to support industry who have already come to us and asked for their rocks to be located in other countries for various reasons and it's important to see how we can support the industry and very quickly onto the final slide my conclusions are that mass our ships that's a brilliant one for us um, where possible we will use current powers that we already have to develop regulations the terminology being considered is automated ship, remote operator and remote master. And our regulations at a secondary level for remotely operated unmanned vessels are ready to go and will be out for consultation soon. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kemp. That was a superb presentation. As with the previous panels, uh, we will hold questions until all of the other panelists have presented. And without further ado, I'd like to turn to our second presenter, who is Hernan Del Frade, uh, who is a technical advisor on safety and environment for the Cantabrian Sea at DGMM slash MITMA. And his presentation will be the Spanish National Working Group on Mass, the importance of different perspectives on regulations. And he's already ahead of me, the, the presentation is up, so I will uh, turn the floor over to him. Oh, well, uh, I can do it myself, I hope. Uh, can you see it? Yes, we can see very well. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Thank you. Uh, I'm more just to consider the, to allow the Spanish government to, to tell what we are doing on the issue of mass. And well, just having a count of time is, is running. I'm gonna start my presentation yet. So, well, as you can see, uh, my presentation is related to the Spanish, Spanish uh, National Working Group on Mass and the importance of different perspectives on regulation. Um, first, I, I want to uh, 
uh, do some initial remarks. Uh, mass, as we know, uh, is a challenge for industry, for users, and for sure for regulators. Um, this is this for that because it's the first time that a new field of maritime transport is regulated while uh, technology is being developed. Uh, we can consider the autom automation of cars and drones as forerunners, but maritime transport has its own specificities. Um, due to these three issues, these three questions, um, a close understanding among the stakeholders is, is needed. So uh, more than two years ago, uh, on a timely series of, of conferences on sustainable transport, at the MIGMA, the, the Spanish Ministry of Transport, where I work at, uh, it sparked the, the idea of a working group on, on, in order to face this challenge because, well, everybody is uh, trying to, to know what, what others are doing, but no, no information was uh, being transferred. So just that in this, in this matter, just when, uh, when developing this working group, just the first question to consider is what is the, the interest of Spain on mass? And it's important for Spain for sure due to the, the, the relevance of the, the geographical position of Spain as a port and coastal state, also as being a flag state, but mainly but these two issues of port because we have a lot of scales at our ports and also the question of uh, being a, a, a state in a geographical position where two of the main traffic lanes in the world pass just in front of our coast. So it's a, a key point to consider. Also, we have to consider the question that the national industry uh, on some building has great interest on in the development of mass, not only in the, in the civil side, but also on the military side, because well, we have some uh, big, uh, uh, big shipyards that are starting to, to to do their own small uh, projects, but they are thinking to, to transfer for the big one. So it's a question we shall consider, and not only this question of the shipyards, but also there are a great array of projects uh, that are developed or under development on a small scale, but they are really important because they are so innovative. Um, just keeping in mind this question, administration, the, the Spanish government shall be aware of technical legal developments in this area. Uh, and the question of technical developments, we have seen we have developments inside of, of the Spanish industries, but also in the legal developments, uh, we are aware that the question shall be treated on, a, on an international way. So Spain is, uh, has participated at the IMO mass regulatory scope in our society, mainly on the topics of uh, the call rates and the search and rescue on the STCW. And also Spain is part of the IMO Maritime Safety Committee Mass uh, Correspondence Group, uh, carrying out the work just now, and at, this, at the European Commission a High Level Steering Group Mass Group. So uh, this is the way we can ensure that we are aware that what are the legal developments outside of Spain. So this is a question. Uh, just of this final idea in this slide is a question that each state is watching what other states do and as we do so so because well other states want to know what we are doing and we want to know what other states are doing it's really important this issue and no states want to be the first to take the steps because well you know what's going on when the first step is, is taken maybe you have a lot of chances to, to get wrong so everybody's uh, cautious on this issue so, well, these are parts of the small projects uh, are now in progress. There are a lot more, but these are some of them, mainly related with the question of uh, uh, research, uh, scientific research, uh, protection and safety, uh, search and rescue, uh, inspection of structures, and many, many others are uh, being developed or under development in Spain. So just going to the main issue, that's the question of the, of the working group. It was started, as we said, after this series of, of conferences of the MIDMA, but at the end of 2020, and the group has only at the, at the beginning, only 70 members. Uh, six meetings has been held since then, and there were online meetings due to the, to the pandemic, but now we are shifting to, the, to, to an hybrid mode. Uh, 
the next meeting will be the seventh, uh, will be held presentially in Madrid in October 24th. So we are changing to an hybrid mode, just uh, having some presential uh, meetings and some others will be will remain on the online mode. At this moment, the, the working group has uh, more than 40 members and is still growing. It, it shows that many, uh, many of the members has uh, contacted many other people that is, are involved in this question and they are being uh, saying, hey, there is a working group. Uh, can you, do you want to stay there? Oh, for sure. And many, many people is, is interesting and many more just uh, back from the summer have seen many uh, mails from people that are interested now in this issue. And what are the, the representatives on the working group? Uh, mainly they came from industry, from shipyards, from system companies, from engineering companies, uh, but also we have representatives of other areas that are really interested in the, in the issue. For instance, is the port authorities, some research bodies that are involved on in the test uh, uh, and development of, of, the, of the mass, uh, the classification societies, especially the DND, and um, also associations uh, uh, of marine interests, for instance, is from the merchant marine uh, uh, officers, also, the, the pilots are being really active on this group. They are the, the both um, associations they have in the Spain, they are participating in the group really actively. Also agents, because they are interested in what, is, what will be developments in the, in, the, in the future, and for sure, the government agencies and many others are still waiting to enter and hope that the next uh, meeting they can participate and be inside the, the, the working group. These are many of the industry representatives of the working group, many of the Spanish uh, uh, enterprises that are uh, interested or working on, on this. As I said, they were mainly uh, shipyards, uh, but also we have um, many uh, systems companies and engineering companies that are working on, on the issue of the mass. It's interesting just to have, and for us, no, there are big uh, industries and small companies, but for us, it, the, the, the information and the opinion or the point of view of anybody is, is, is important, no matter the side of, in the, of, your, in the, of your enterprise. And also by the side of uh, associations, mainly we have uh, government bodies, for instance, of course, the Ministry of Transport, also Salvamento Maritimo, which is the, the, the Spanish agency related to the traffic management, not only with the search and rescue, but the traffic management, that they are really interested in the side of the VTS. Uh, also some um, research bodies as the National Institute on Aerospatial Techniques, because they are being working, carrying out some uh, tests and, and trials. Also the Basque government uh, agency, also the, the, the governing body of the of the port authorities of Spain is inside. Also the, the class of the near DMV, the pilots associations, interest and main uh, public industry on the on the defense side and technologies. Uh, the agencies, uh, as I told you, they are interested also. Uh, also, for instance, is the research bodies from the oceanographic side of the Blocan, who has been presented today, uh, yesterday has presented a, a just a PPT here. Also, the Association of the, of the Merchant Marine Officers and many other bodies of, of research. What are the tasks of the working group? Well, the, the first was to know what are the different stakeholders in Spain, because, well, it, it allows us to have a broad view of ongoing and, uh, and future projects and what are the interests and, uh, that we shall consider in the working group. Also, what other the tasks were the change experience and point of view uh, from their side, for, of course, and also from our side. And also uh, a part we carry out from the, from the administration, from the government is just to inform about international developments because, well, we are on these uh, working groups and, and correspondence groups. It's important just to let them know what's going on on the regulatory side, uh, international level. And also serve presentation on common issues on mass. We have a, a really interesting session. Just uh, take the points of view of uh, the customers of uh, the mass, the, the, the shipyard and the systems company that define it. And also in this presentation, we have the, the part of the engineering company that uh, prepared the, the, the trials procedures and also the uh, surveillance from the administration that, that carry out inspections of this, this trial. So these four 
level point of view was really, really interesting. Also, one of the tasks is just to prepare get guidelines and recommendations for uh, just to have for the industry some, uh, some path to follow. And also one of the main tasks in this, the, the main purpose of the, of the group, working group is to, to propose ideas on regulatory development just at national or international level. Um, what will be the next steps? Uh, well, um, first is to assist the representatives at IMO and the European Commission groups, especially at the Maritime Safety Correspondence, Correspondence Group on Mass, just to, to give some information to our representatives there and, and give them ideas and issues to, to, to treat on the, on the meetings. Also, just to develop the internal relation basis, as I told you, just to know, to have the big picture may help us to know what are the concerns of, of the, the stakeholders and just to develop the regulation with keeping this in mind. Also, a next step is just to establish links with academia because while well, many universities are interested in participating with, uh, within the, uh, to be within the group. And also, as I told you, that to, to held the first uh, presidential meeting on October 24th. And the very next day we'll have the first national conference on mass to be held in Madrid on, on October 25th. It will be a, a important part that we are organizing just now, what will be the agenda and, and what will be uh, the, the presentations of this agenda. And just to go on faster, just now in the time is running, uh, serious conclusions of the working group uh, task, yes, First, uh, that knowing the, the different interests uh, may help to achieve an holistic approach to the issue. That was the first, uh, the first task of the group. Uh, a second part that is not expected, but was really effective was to put in touch different stakeholders that assist them on reaching their objectives. There are many exchange of information or, or just to share projects or whatever. It has been a, an unexpected uh, outcome from the group. And also just the, the informations from all parties defines a big picture because we may have the position from the government and we, have, we may have other information, but we, have, we don't have all the information and they give us the, the, the information that, that lacks, that we lack. No? So we have the big picture on that. And also uh, the different projects um, can get, that they carry out or developing can give an idea of the trends of the field and helps to, to anticipate the next move. And just for just the main conclusion is that the consideration of the needs of four parties can set the path to an effective regulation. Um, and just as the last share, just thanking you for your attention for sure, uh, just included a picture of the boat Vizcaya in the port of Bilbao in 1906, exactly on the 6th of September. It, may, it was 116 years ago. It was the first remotely controlled ship in the world. Tesla, a couple of years before in New York, uh, has tested a, a simple, simpler uh, small boats on the Madison Square Garden. But this is not the case. This is a, 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 it's a, it's a real ship, it's a boat. And we can see in the bow, we can see the, the antenna that received the, the radio signals. And at the, on the poop, we can see the systems, the telequino, uh, the invention of uh, Leonardo Torres Quevedo that allows to control the rudder and the course, and also the, the, the engine of the, of the boat. Just only with this image, I want to say you thank you very much for your attention and just uh, stay aware of your questions if you have them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Deb Fade. Uh, that last picture is really fascinating considering it's uh, almost a century um, ago. So our next presenter is uh, Mazan Abdelmoen Kobtan from the Suez Canal Economic Zone. And he's going to present on organizational obstacles facing governments and maritime industry in implementing mass projects. So I, I'm a little bit concerned we may be having some technical difficulties with our next presenter, but I'm hoping that he is online. Okay. 
I, I'm not seeing him. So we'll try and work that out behind the scenes. And in the meantime, uh, perhaps I could turn now to Captain Sigar from Singapore. He is the Assistant Chief Executive of Operations of the Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore. And he is going to present on um, some of Singapore's experiences with mass. So over to you, Captain Sigar. Okay, we are having some problems seeing your screen up. No. Can you see our screen? Uh, we can see you, um, but we were not seeing your presentation. Uh, there we go. Yes, we can see it now. Thank you. Thank you, Gillian. Uh, good day, everyone. Today, I'll be sharing about some of the mass trials that have been conducted in Singapore, uh, the challenges we face, the next step for us, as well as how challenges can be changed into opportunities. Excellent. Singapore maintains a close a working relationship with the maritime technology ecosystem. This includes collaborating with various industry partners such as uh, technology service providers, marine service providers, and Institute of Higher Learning. MPA also collaborates with the partners on various projects, including co-funding innovative projects, of which are several mass uh, pilot projects. Uh, these mass pilot projects in Singapore focus on solutions that can be implemented in the port of Singapore. Today, I will share with you about three mass pilot projects which feature harbor tasks, which can potentially operate within the port of Singapore. Intelita, Smart Maritime Autonomous Vessel, and Project Maneuver. At the first glance, one might think that the projects would be similar since they feature harbor tasks. However, these projects have fundamentally different visions of how the first phase towards autonomous tax will present itself. Essentially, the projects serve as a proof of concepts for different concepts of operation for autonomous tax. The various concepts and technology tested included autonomous navigation, collision detection and collision avoidance technology, and remote control navigation. The Intelita project is a collaboration between technology provider Vatsila, marine services provider PSA Marine, uh, the classification society Lloyd's Register, the technology center for offshore and marine Singapore, and MPA itself. The concept behind Intelita was to provide supervised autonomous control for harbor tasks, aiming to assist the onboard task master by passage planning and providing enhanced situational awareness. The harbor tug used was retrofitted with sensors and cameras, which enables autonomous capabilities. During the sea trial for Intelitag, which was actually the first sea trial for Singapore's regulatory sandbox for Mars, the Intelitag smart navigation system was put to test. When given a destination, the smart navigation system plots an optimized route which will be displayed on the onboard console. The task then follows the plotted course, dynamically maintaining predetermined safe distances. Sea trial scenarios was also included, testing the IntelliTax collision detection avoidance ability when faced with virtual and real life vessels, both moving and stationary. The IntelliTax verifies its capability and was a success. The Smart Maritime Autonomous Vessel is a project conducted in collaboration with technology provider ST Engineering Marine, Tax Service Provider Porsche, Classification Society ABS, and Telecommunication Provider M1. This project set out to develop a harbor tug with autonomous navigation capabilities, coupled with a shore command center capable of remotely controlling the vessel. The health of the hull, mechanical and electrical systems of the vessel was also be remotely monitored at the shore command center. The sea trial for smart maritime autonomous vessel was a success, demonstrating the both the harbor tax autonomous navigation capabilities with collision detection and collision avoidance when faced with real moving, real life moving vessels and the ability 
to be remotely controlled by the Shaw Command Center. The testing scenarios with the real life moving vessel included the head on overtaking and crossing situations. The next project, the project maneuver, a collaboration between Keppel Offshore and Marine, ABB, ABS, Classification Society, ABS, TCOMS, and NPA, also features a Shaw Command Center. The Shaw Command Center features display which reflect the visibility from the vessel, operator screens, a joystick, and lever as well. For project maneuver, there were two phases of sea trials that were conducted. The first phase involved testing and remote control capability of the harbor tub from the shore command center and the transfer of command procedures between the onboard and shore captains. While the second phase demonstrated the autonomous navigation, collision and detection and collision avoiding capabilities. Both phases the sea trials were a success. Despite the trial's success, there were still some challenges that were faced during the trials. The key challenges faced were connectivity and communications related. The connectivity challenge presented itself during the trials of the Smart Maritime Autonomous Vessel and Project Maneuver. This is because these two projects had a remote center and an information piped back to remote center. The Intelita had no such issues as the entire suite of systems and control were on board. The connectivity issues included signal strength and stability and intermittent connectivity, contributing factors to the connectivity issues that have been identified include bad weather and passing vessel traffic resulting in a loss of line of sight. We had to bear in mind that these connectivity issues arose when only a single vessel was undergoing trial, which had uplink requirements in the tents. If there were such constraints in supporting such one vessel within our port, it bears thinking about how are we to move towards operationalizing it to a wider scale. As for communications, the three trials maintain the same way of communications as for conventional vessels with the men on board communicating with nearby vessels and the port operation control center via VHF. Despite the trial vessels being able to navigate autonomously, a person is still required on board for the communication requirement. To, en to enable autonomous vessels to communicate with conventional vessels without reliance of a man is a challenge that I'm sure many of us are facing. This hence bring me to the next point. Such common issues faced by many highlights that need to work together, it's up to us to turn these challenges into opportunities to collaborate. Most of us are aware of the need for collaboration and harmonization. The need is especially pressing now with the proliferation of new technologies. We have to ensure that the various developments will be compatible and are interoperable and that moving forward, authorities and organizations are in active discussion so that everyone will be on the same page. I'm glad to share that I'm aware of many such collaborations. For example, there's the Mass Sport Initiatives, ILR Mass Task Force, and ISO Mass Navigation Project Team that have been established to name a few. These collaborations are also starting to reach out to one another to ensure that progress made on various fronts are in line and not contradicting. I, for one, am excited for what new few years will bring. Speaking of the next few years, it is time to talk about the future. In the case of Singapore, we envisage to be a future-ready port for mass operations, a vision that will allow for coexistence of mass and conventionally manned ships within our port waters. You might be wondering if connectivity is one of the key challenges faced by the trial for just one vessel, how does Singapore plan to be a future ready port for mass operation? For a start, Singapore is working towards having a dedicated 5G network over port waters by mid-2025. 
it is our hope that 5G coverage over the port will help facilitate the connectivity needs of masks within the port. As for the trials, the, phase, the first phase was dedicated to testing out the autonomous tax in a sanitized sandbox area. What we hope to do in the next few phases of trial is to test the performance of autonomous tax in our fairways to see how the tax interact with real traffic. We also aim to try more than one tax at a single time so that we can also test the inter-autonomous tax interaction. These upcoming developments are just start of what will be a very exciting period full of innovations and change. Singapore looks forward to embracing the future and we are open to work and discuss with interested member states to accelerate the progress of mass. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Captain uh, Sigar. That was, uh, as with the others, an interesting presentation and uh, I appreciated that you kept to, uh, to time. So our next presenter is is uh, certainly well known to those of us at, at IMO, as many of the other presenters have been. It's Marco Rakanen, and I apologize if I have pronounced uh, your name wrong, uh, who currently is the ecosystem lead at the 1C Association. And he will give us a presentation on industry stakeholders' perspectives on the regulatory framework. And so, Marco, I invite you to take the floor. Thank you, Gillian. Let's see now if I get this running. Here we are. I Perfect. Hope can... Yeah, we can see it. Okay. So, on behalf of the 1C members, I'm happy to present the manufacturing industry's views on the needed regulatory framework. Uh, probably the last speaker, so I hope you still have some energy for the last sprint here. <clears throat> uh, the developers and manufacturing industry need confidence through the regulations in order to be able to put in place a strategic decision on investments and productions. It's evident that such commitments cannot be made without confidence in the future regulatory environment. Uncertainties in the requirements, assurance, approval, and certification process may delay investments in production, further preventing availability of necessary technology that would be required to reach the goals and expectations set by this organization. This means that the work on the regulatory framework should provide predictability, allowing for technology development to be properly directed. When the manufacturing industry is talking about systems, that is factual from the technology point of view, but totally unknown in the regulatory framework. Although human is part of the system as defined in a number of international standards. Already nowadays, a vessel is made up of a set of systems that are highly coupled and reliant on inputs and outputs to perform the required functions. The ship function may be operated by one system or multiple systems. For the foreseeable future, increasingly automated ships will be delivered through specific combinations of automated functions. And each system might be operating on a different level of automation, either continuously or periodically. The regulatory development should not start from the presumption that ships are to be crewless but from the philosophy that the development of technology makes it possible for tasks on board the vessel to be promoted, be remotely operated, automated or autonomous in order to relieve the crew members for rest or other duties. The system can be autonomous and the aggregated sum of such systems will in the long term enable a comprehensive autonomous ship operation. The difference between an autonomous function and non-autonomous function is the fallback state. If any of the processes fail, 
a human intervenes to help to recover the system. If there's no one on board, the fallback state could be very different to a conventional ship. The goal of the mass regulatory work should be a creation of an instrument that is as straightforward as possible and addresses only the new concepts and operations. Ships and its systems and functions defined as mass should be considered fully incorporated to the current maritime traffic system. It cannot be assumed that the current base instrument seamlessly applied to mass. The mass code will need to overturn or replace some requirements of the base instruments to remove the uncertainties and blocks hindering the rollout of increasingly or fully autonomous ships and services. The ONE members welcomes the decision to regulate these technologies through the goal-based approach. That should enable approval of individual systems addressing the ship functions. Such requirements should also facilitate scalable solutions, not hindering innovation, development and combination of technologies and approaches. The regulation should support the approach that a mix of remote and human operation with increased automation is equivalent to an onboard human crew. The purpose should be to provide for a set of functional requirements and acceptance criteria that safeguards that technology and systems are safe to operate. Increased automation or autonomy increases safety and efficiency in itself. Overregulating or creating excessive requirements will not increase safety or reliance. Resilience. The automated functions will need to be covered on several levels. The definitions developed by the 1C members are suggested to be applied to ship functions and not to ships. The three different concepts that are that need to be addressed are advanced assisting or supporting systems that requires a certain level of human attendance, autonomy by self-sustaining algorithms and systems, and finally remote operation creating a totally new infrastructure. Autonomous systems and concepts will be developed in a in all transport modes, air, land, and sea, using same basic components and parts and might be operating through all environments. Functions might be addressed by similar concepts and features and therefore a common vocabulary in shipping and uniform understanding on basis would be preferred. As an example, if the code is to regulate levels of automation, the reference to autonomous is misleading. Consistency in the term, in the use of the term ship and the term vessel need to be clarified as the intent and application differs. Wake terms such as short period or high extent would need further consideration regarding quantification or if there could be a qualitative distinction. A uniform vocabulary is needed for the owners and operators to be able to know what is available and determine what common taxonomy or what kind of ship do they want to have. It's needed for the industry to be able to offer a solution for a customer request and to be able to market the products with common taxonomy. It's needed for the regulators to be able to define rules, regulations, and certification policies based on the common taxonomy. It's needed for the general public to be able to understand what is going on and for the infrastructure providers to be able to provide the right solution. Such common understanding could provide financial benefits through common assurance processes and reduce the cost of components and software. In an automated transport chain, it is important to understand that air, land, and maritime-based automated and autonomous systems will interact. Ships may be loaded, stowed, and discharged by land-based automated or autonomous cargo handling systems that need to fulfill land-based safety requirements and standards. It should not be necessary to, have, to also have such cargo systems separately 
and additionally approved by maritime certification bodies. It will be necessary to select the most appropriate safety assurance approach and further discussions regarding software quality assurance and software development process management might be needed. It's essential to define what compelling body of evidence needs to be submitted for autonomous and automated ship to be granted approval or certification. Without such defined set of evidence, there is a risk ending up in differing demands for proof and evidence by different certification bodies and flag states. The objective of certification is that autonomous technology is safe in performing its designed task in all conditions encountered and at least corresponding to the safety of a non-mass ship. We should not try to reinvent the wheel without taking into consideration lessons learned from other sectors. Their participants, summoning up here regarding the issue of national regulatory development. Although we commend the member states having been proactive and so advancing and enabled trials and technology development in domestic waters, in the long run, the industry needs a worldwide accepted functional regulatory framework, including agreed assurance, approval, and certification framework, in order to abide in order to avoid to end up with a multitude of national approaches and unpredictable requirements and procedures. Our members through the one Sea Association support the IMO initiative for mandatory worldwide framework for mass operations. The sooner this is in place with a certain predictability and certainty, the sooner the necessary technology solutions and concepts will be available to the shipping community. Thank you all for having listened to me and hope looking forward to the questions afterward. Thank you. Thank you. Oops, I'm back. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Marco. So we'll make one more attempt uh, with our colleague from the Suez Canal Economic Zone. I don't think we've been able to resolve the technological issues, but I will give one more attempt call out to see if he's there. And it seems like not. So then I would suggest that we move on to the uh, question and answer period for our last panel. And as before, if you are interested in posing a question to the panel, can you please indicate so in the chat along with uh, the name of your delegation? And maybe while we're doing that to get the ball rolling, I was going to ask panelists uh, regarding what issues they think the IMO needs to urgently resolve so that there can be effective national regulation. And uh, perhaps what I'll do is I'll, I'll go in the order of the, the presenters. So um, Katrina from the UK, since you um, seem to have uh, considered some of these issues in, in some detail, I'll, I'll turn first to you. So, I mean, yeah, I feel like I'm putting my neck on the line coming in here first. But I think from, from our perspective, and I think possibly reflecting some of the conversations that happened earlier, it's it's that rock being based in another country. I think, yes, yes, we need, there's lots of other aspects in terms of allowing international voyages. But right now, we're being asked by companies that want rocks overseas. There are jurisdictional questions. We've got options that we can consider. They're not perfect, but they will help us. But I think if there was something firmed up from an IMO perspective there, that could really help progress this and actually support the different industries that are out there doing it. Super, thank you. Uh, turning next to um, Mr. Delfrade, do you have any thoughts on this based on your uh, your Spanish working group? Yeah, <clears throat> mainly you have seen, I just uh, coincide with uh, Dr. Kemp. Uh, well, we have seen now that the issue is uh, restricted to the national waters, uh, of course, the territorial sea. And, and so, and I mean that one of the main key points could be the question of the uh, training of, of seafarers, especially. 
because well, it's a point uh, as Dr. Kemp said on her presentation, it's uh, the the issue of not considering CFRs by Britain, yeah? uh, the the remote operators. Uh, it doesn't take off. Uh, it doesn't um, avoid the question, the, the, the main question of they they must have experience and what should be the the the, the contents of the training they, they they should have. I mean, it's the, the main issue. At this moment, I mean, by my side, because while technology may advance and may be developed, but the question of, of training of seafarers is, uh, I mean, it's an urgent question. It's the main question. Thank you. And thank you very much. And now turning to Singapore, please. Thank you, Gilead. Uh, I, my view is that we need the mass code, and that must come out quickly and is urgent. Uh, the reason I say that is the industry is moving fast and, and industry wants to do testing. They need guidelines. And so there's two things. One is we need a code, the mass code. And the next thing is a little bit more detailed guidelines because today, if you see from the presentations, everybody is doing their trials and tests within the national jurisdiction. We have to move. The ship, the mass ship has to move to another port and we need international guidelines and we need to harmonize these so that we can do it in a very safe manner. So in my mind, these are the two key things which I hope IMO can uh, concentrate and expedite. The IMO code, uh, 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 a non-mandatory code is good for the start so that the industry can move on. Uh, and, and that is very important because uh, we see from the yesterday's and today's presentation, people are looking at terminology. Uh, some wants to call it mass, some wants to call it automated ships. So I think there is different and uh, there's, there's uh, importance and uh, uh, we need to move fast on this. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. And now for an industry perspective, uh, I'll turn to you, Marco. Yeah, thank, thank you, Julian. Um, in regard, irrespective, we are talking about uh, IMO regulations or national legislation. I think the most important part is that we agree on the terminology and the definitions. As long as these are differing and we are using different kind of definitions and different kind of terminology, it will end up that the, the legislation is not going to be easy to align in the long, long run. So, so for the basis, we need to agree on the terminology. Uh, speaking of on what Katrina said about the rocks, that is probably, after all the discussions we have had internally, the most difficult thing to address, both in aligning technology and operation, but also from the perspective of that it's uh, uh, on the national sovereignty issue and, and uh, in that sense trying to solve that through international agreed agreements or something like that can take years and years and years uh, and, and of course the industry is keen on having this technical standards at least agreed as soon as possible that they can start planning on this uh, I believe that, that, that the, the problems of jurisdiction on rocks maybe could be solved through bilateral agreements at the beginning, which we in the long run develop. And in, in some years, 10 years, 15 years, they might be aligned to be used as a common agreeable standard for for the rocks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there is also a question that has come to, to me. I don't think it went to the entire chat, um, but I will read it out. It's a question from, from Germany, and they're asking if there are multinational or regional cooperation mechanisms to approve mass for certain regions, for example, in the Balkans or in the North Sea, which would allow for the harmonization of national approaches. 
so um, I'm not certain who wants to attack that one first. Maybe I'll just do it in reverse order and uh, we'll go with you first, Marco, and then I'll work my way backwards. Uh, thank you, Julian. Uh, there has been discussions on this, but uh, probably due to the hardships we have had the last years and so on, it had, hasn't that bad. So I think at the moment, all these projects and concepts are, concepts are done in, in, in national waters, but for the moment, no, there hasn't been any starts of such discussions on having an area, international area for, for, for testing or regulations. So not at the moment. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and so now I'll go to, to Singapore. And perhaps in addition to answering the question of whether such cooperation arrangements exist, you could also express your views on, on whether they might be helpful or not. So go ahead, Captain Cigar. I'm, uh, thank you. I, I'm not sure there is. I doubt there is. But if you, uh, I slightly touched uh, in my slide that we have this mass network of ports. And I think that is what the uh, mass network of ports initiative, which is led by Singapore and some of the uh, countries have participated. That is what we are trying to achieve. If we can get the standards and if we can harmonize and then we can exchange the guidelines we have and best practices, I think then we can come up a kind of a, a, a best practices kind of a guidelines. Uh, I hope we could achieve that. Uh, but the last two years, we were a little set back by the uh, COVID-19. Uh, I hope that uh, moving ahead, we could achieve something and I hope that we could achieve in our region. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, now moving to, to Spain and uh, Mr. Del Fade. Well, I, I mean, uh, inside the high level steering group where I meet on the last meeting we have presidentially, I meet, I meet Ms. Kemp. Uh, one of the issues, it was held in, in Norway, I mean. Um, one of the issues was the question of just to have common standards from, from the European states. Uh, it was a, a main issue, not only the question of training, as I've said before, but also in the question of test, as, as Mr. Uh, Marco Rahigan said, but also just to allow the permit of other states uh, just to, to have a kind of guidelines or, or whatever, uh, just to allow other states to um, operate on on other states, yeah, it's uh, it's, uh, it's it will be a good way to to handle this question. But at this moment, as Captain Segar said, uh, everything has stopped a lot. Uh, it's expected that now this this autumn things resume, and I mean, one of the, this will be one of the key points. Indeed, thank you very much. And uh, last but by no means least, uh, uh, Katrina. Yeah, so from the UK perspective, we did, um, I think it was 2019, time goes quickly, um, the voyage between the UK and Belgium. And that was arranged on a, a sort of case by case basis, but it involved a lot of collaboration between um, both administrations to ensure actually we understood each other's requirements. Um, and it worked very well and what we had hoped to do but as others have said um, has been sort of sidelined by other priorities due to COVID was establish some form of agreement that didn't necessarily set it up as a test area but did introduce the idea that if you wanted to go between particular countries we all understood our requirements we all understood what someone else was expecting and we we sort of almost had this pre-arranged group that we were happy to engage with not to say we wouldn't engage with others but it was it was sort of a starting point however um because of other priorities within the maritime sector and other political priorities it's it's not taken off but it's something we'd definitely be interested in um yeah but as everyone else has said it's about that that timing of it and it's not just the um administrations willing to it's actually the then there needs to be the sort of political will as well. It's a slightly sort of, it's not just that technological, we want to support the projects. There's some slightly bigger questions going on as well. Thank you very much all. And so you'll notice in the chat, um, our colleague from Denmark has highlighted a project to sail a test between Norway and Denmark. Uh, 
and also some discussions with with Germany. So it looks like there is stuff starting to happen in this space. And as you've all said, post COVID, um, I hope that this should be somewhat uh, easier. Um, now, before I end for the day, I'd just like to invite one last time people to uh, anyone who wishes to ask a question of the panel to indicate so in the chat. Right, I guess um, it's been a long day and uh, we're anxious to, uh, to get on with other things. So um, I'd like to close this panel uh, by thanking uh, the panelists very much for their, their contributions. Um, I, I think the national experiences uh, that you've had are informative and certainly useful as we move towards developing the mass code. Now, just maybe taking a step back and, and looking at our day as a whole, I think that there are some general things that, that came up for me. First of all, I think masks can operate under UNCLOS, but there are some practical and interpretive issues that will need to be addressed by the IMO as the competent international organization. There are certainly some difficulties, but they don't seem to be inter insurmountable. And like Mr. Lockham said, it's important to look at these issues now rather than after the fact. And I would add, I also think it's important to be pragmatic, as a number of our speakers this morning said. It's unlikely that we will amend on clause, so we need to find a way to address the, the issues within our own house. My other conclusion would be that almost everyone agreed that the master can also be based on shore. And as we've just heard, the draft UK education calls this person the remote master. And I think that there is some scope there for the IMO to uh, consider the role of the remote master and how uh, that role should be regulated. A number of specific practical issues, including those relating to enforcement, don't necessarily come up directly in the development of the mass code, but they interrelate with issues like communications and will need to be considered carefully as we develop this instrument to ensure that our regime is effective. And to me, that was one of the more interesting things that came out of the day, just the, the corollary issues uh, that at IMO, we don't always directly address because we have a well-developed regime for most maritime matters, but will have to be considered specifically within the mass context. National regulatory work to date has highlighted a number of issues and they're similar to those raised at the IMO. And I think it would behoove us to consider national experience as we develop uh, the international mass code. And my final conclusion is, and I, I raise this because I think this is unique what we're doing uh, today and at the joint working group. It's really a collaboration between various IMO committees that I personally have not seen elsewhere. And I think to be effective going forward, we'll need to have both technical and legal experts uh, to work together to ensure that we succeed in, in our goal. So I'm going to leave it at that for my conclusions for the day. I'd like to thank all of the participants uh, for your attendance and in particular to our presenters uh, for the really superb work that they've done in bringing forward interesting and concise presentations. It takes an awful lot of work to put um, something like this together. And I'm very grateful to all of you for your time and, and for exposing us to some very thought provoking issues, which I think will assist the IMO as we move forward. I'd also like to thank the Secretariat who have done tireless work behind the scenes to, to make today's uh, seminar and yesterday's come off. And it was really a collaboration between the Maritime Safety Division and the Legal Affairs uh, Office. And they're all a pleasure to work with and uh, I'm very grateful to them. And I'm sure that um, my co-host uh, of the seminar, Henrik Kumpers, is as well. And with that, I think we can release you a, a few minutes early. Uh, for those of you who are participating in the joint working group tomorrow, we'll look forward to seeing you then. I believe we start at 11 o'clock uh, London time. And for those of you who are not participating and indeed to everyone, I wish you an excellent rest of the day. Thank you and goodbye.